<laughs> yeah. This man eats like right? 300 grams of protein a day. He's getting 300 grams? Yeah. I was surprised. Like, I mean, that's a lot. It, it doesn't seem. Your poop see... stories are going to increase. <laughs> well, so I don't know. I'm, I'm going to ask somebody who definitely has a lot more knowledge than me, but there's, I think there's definitely something to the uh, MK677 that I'm taking because ever since I started, my poops have been totally normal. Hmm. No explosions out the back, no emergencies, <laughs> just pretty straightforward, just regular, regular taking the dump. Hmm. How long has that, that been happening? It's since I, so probably like seven weeks now. Oh, you've yeah. been having normal poops. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's, it's a miracle. Deal. So I think I'm retaining more calories than I have in the past too because I have been gaining weight. Could be something that you're taking, but it could just be your body has finally adjusted to some of the diet that you because you, hopefully, yeah, you've been messing around with diet stuff for a while, and right, maybe you just have the tools to have a normal stool every once in a while. Tools for normal stools. <laughs> That's right. I like it. That's what we need. Yeah, it's amazing how poop is the ultimate fantasy. Like a good poop, it really <laughs> is. It's now like the gold standard. Like shit. today is literally a good day. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, somebody told me a while back that um, there. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know where it stands now. But uh, I called it an analyzer. <laughs> this is going to get interesting. I know it's going to get good real quick, right? Um, but basically, it was uh, something that can tell you like about your poop. Mm -hmm. But I was like, man, could you imagine if you had that like in your house? It could give you like feedback and information about like you know whether you're on track with your eating or oh, I, I mean it give you a lot of information about your gut health and a lot of information about your, it's a lot of it's in your poop yeah mm -hmm. right. you I would know? hit a PR a lot of great, every day yeah a lot of great information's <laughs> in your blood there's a lot of great information in your in your butt too I probably set <laughs> records for volume back in the day yeah <laughs> oh yeah that could be another thing it could yeah. it could like take a picture of you like when you've taken your biggest dump or something <laughs> <laughs> you stand up and you take a picture <laughs> yeah like woo yeah stack butt stuff mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> always you get to uh talk about how much it weighed and everything that's actually something i was curious about like if they could somehow implement a scale inside a toilet like, you know, here's the base weight. I mean, it's so complicated because of the water. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what I mean, though. But, like, it would always measure This guy's measure at Stanford. It. He could probably figure it out. Man, There's a lot I'll of smart people over there. There's smart people rubbing off on you? No, not at all. Oh. Like, it's all a fake. Like, I've totally faked my way into the situation. So, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Do yeah. you, by some odd chance, know a guy named Ron Fedko? No. Who's oh, Ron? Oh, man. Can you Ron. grab the, the mic and just kind of aim it towards you? Ooh. Oh, there you go. Boop. Yeah, Ron. There you go. Yeah. Ron Fedko, he used mm -hmm. to be my powerlifting coach a long time ago yeah. and he ended up being a professor at Stanford but there's probably a shit ton of people at Stanford so right. makes sense he wouldn't run into him but he used to be a savage powerlifter no shit he uh, bench pressed 225 I saw him do it uh, he benched 225 for 64 reps Jesus he benched around 545 he competed at 220 and 198 really he was just super oh. strong I think he was squatting 7 and pulling 7 you know he was just just oh use a, and he's brilliant. He, uh, well, he has yeah, he has so he has a PhD in um, like mathematics and something and f like wow. a, some sort of specifics on mathematics. I can't remember exactly what it was, um, but then he actually went on to win a uh, an Academy Award because what? he took his math and he applied it to uh, special effects, oh. and he helped make special effects for water. Wow. And like just to, him and the team he worked with, the company he worked with, they won an Academy Award. It was like unbelievable. Is this like, you're describing Beast from X Men? Like, yeah, that's that's what it sounds like. No, this right. guy, this guy's like, it's, yeah, he, it's not, he's, he's twisted, you know what I mean? Right, like he's, right. he's, uh, <laughs> it's not safe for him to be like out, you know, out in the streets, basically. He's like bipolar on top of all this. So Good it's, for him. yeah, some puts in some uh, interesting uh, twist into his. Wow relationships and stuff anyway we got Corey schlesinger here did i say it right close enough Schles schlesing how did we say schlesinger it? schlesinger yeah, i did yeah. get it right it was, it was schlesinger yeah <laughs> i'm pumped up man i'm fired up to talk to you appreciate being here man you know strength being a strength coach for basketball players like <clears throat> you know a lot of times these really talented athletes sometimes they don't want to get after it you know so i just was just talking to a friend this morning uh, a good friend of mine uh, for, for many, many years, Ben Alderman. He just recently got into working with some basketball uh, athletes, some guys that um, that might be picked up in an upcoming draft and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And he said, man, I, I have never done this before. I've never worked with people that 
that don't really want to work out that much. <laughs> like they, they do want to work out. They do want to get better, uh, but they don't have like this burning desire. They're going there because they're supposed to go there. They're going there because um, a lot of times uh, your camp or whoever you're with is helping you get drafted, your agency rather. Mm -hmm. uh, they're paying for you to get some of these treatments, uh, massage therapies and different things, and they're paying for you to go train. But you don't really want to train. You're seven foot three and you dominate and you're like, <laughs> I'm good, man. I don't want to like lift. And the, the process of lifting, it takes a really long time to, to gain any strength. Do you face any of that or is it different being at Stanford? Um, it's, it's easier at Stanford as far as getting the quote unquote buy-in uh, because these kids, they've jumped through hoops their whole life just to get into Stanford, mm. right? And the way they think about development is, well, hard work. Right? And it doesn't matter what form hard work comes in, whether it's studying hard or playing basketball hard or lifting hard or preparing for sport hard. So at Stanford, I was able to pull off some things that I don't think I'd ever be able to pull off anywhere else. We do this uh, methodology called microdosing. So essentially, we're in season training and we lift six times a week. Um, and it sounds crazy, right? Like, oh my gosh, your training volume's so high. But once again, it's, it's in small little increments. And essentially, we just take one major movement and ride the hell out of it that day. And we do it before they go into their individuals and then right into team practice. So essentially it's more of like a glorified strength warm up, more so than anything, or a potentiation. Um, and so how we organize it's pretty simple. We go more max effort work, you know, obviously further away from competition. Mm -hmm. And then on game days, it's a lot more elastic and reactive. And so you can fit in in a week, I mean, six different training sessions. If you do a lot of, I mean, if you do very similar things every day, then the kid who wasn't very good at lifting weights, just from the volume, the sheer volume alone, all of a sudden motor learning, they're able to actually train really well. Yeah, they're actually good looking weightlifters, even though they have seven foot two wingspans, because it's just the sheer experience alone. I mean, in one season, if you look at it from a volume standpoint or a frequency standpoint, they've done four years of training than what they typically done in one season. So that's what's, mm -hmm been great about Stanford because no one even questioned it. <laughs> I just came through and I was like, look, we're going to lift every day. This is how we're going to set it up. You guys are going to come in, knock this out, go right into practice. And then from that perspective, like, yeah, at the beginning, it was a little bit of rumblings like, man, we lift every day. Like, what the, f you know? And then from that, I was, I made it really simple. I was like, whoa, here's option B. And I just made option B and C way worse <laughs> than option A. I'm like, okay, we can come in early in the morning, train for an hour and a half, two to three times a week. In season, I don't think you want to do that, right? No, no, that sounds terrible. Yeah, so I'm only bringing you in once a day. So now I'm removing a stress alone. And I think that's the biggest aspect that we're not seeing in enough, in, especially in sports performance, is the holistic stress. And then, of course, being a kid at Stanford, that stress, the academic load, it's way, way higher. So for me, it's almost like a control every single day. I see these guys, and now I can see from a readiness standpoint where they are, have that conversation with the coach before they go into that dynamic environment, a.k.a. practice, and now we can start making or have more flexibility within our training. So now that there's more autonomy in their training, there's more um, actualization in their practice. And so, yeah, that's for us, it's more readiness. People, uh, you know, they really under, they undersell and then they also over talk about recovery and they talk about recovery in weird ways. I think as soon as we talk recovery, we're kind of thinking about stretching and foam rolling and massage therapy. Um, but I always think recovery starts with the training process. Oh, amazing. Yep. You know, and, and it sounds to me like, man, if I'm an athlete and you're telling me we're going to probably do like one movement a day with maybe, maybe I'm sure there's still a variable in there of, of some warm up, Right. And then there's uh there might be like a quote unquote, like back off set or something mm -hmm. in there. You can explain a little further in a minute. But, um, if you were to tell me, yeah, you're just going to do one exercise, but we're coming in and do it every day right away. My mind would be like, oh shit. Like, that's kind of cool. Like, I get to lift. We're going to be able to, like, probably work pretty hard while we lift, and then we're going to be able to work pretty hard in practice because I'm not going to be slowed down by this this lifting. And a lot of athletes, you know, a lot of athletes think lifting is kind of stupid. They're like, don't they don't want to do it. It's not, it's not their thing. Their thing is the sport a lot of times. That's what they're passionate about. That's what we're excited about. So I think that from that perspective, I would think, I'd be like, damn, I'm going to be fresh for both. That's going to be sick. Right. I mean, the one thing that I like the most is it's just habit forming. Like, especially when they're not away from me or when they are away from me. I mean, that's kind of their routine. As soon as they go, like they're doing pickup or they're going to go hit some dumbbell snatches or they're going to go through complex. 
So for us, our warm up is complex every day. The Istvan Yavorik's work, where essentially you have a barbell, dumbbell, kettlebell in your hands, and you go through basic movement patterns: RDL, like or a hinge, a hip flexion, maybe a triple extension, a push, and a pull. And essentially, you do that every single day. If you break that down, that's every movement that you would ever train, yeah. right? Besides the bench press. So these guys, these guys are becoming great hingers because they're getting the volume. Squatters, great pressers, and great rowers. Like, what else do you want? And then you do that through a long period of time. All you're doing is building up that capacity mm. so they can actually get strong one day. And essentially, you look at that complex, for instance, we'll use like cleans, for example. If you're doing a clean complex before you go hit heavy cleans, well, if I'm looking at 20 kilos on the bar in your complex and it looks like shit, probably not going to be a good day. Mm. Hey, pack it up. You're good, man. Like, you, hey, you hit, you hit your warm up set. Go ahead and go. But I don't want to miss those opportunities that they want to get awesome. You know, like there's days, and you've just experienced this, you feel like shit, you're probably hungover, whatever, you come in, and all of a sudden you hit a PR, you're like, where the fuck did that come from? <laughs> but if we only train one to two times a week in season, quote unquote, maintenance, which you see in all basketball, you're going to miss all of those opportunities to actually get strong. Those, those opportunities are going to come once every blue moon. But for us, it's coming like two to three times a week, depending on how our training is. So look, if we, if we really break it down from a holistic stress standpoint, all I'm doing is priming them up for practice. If you only did one movement every day, think about it like, all right, Mark, you're coming in, you're squatting. That's the only movement I'm going to let you do. You're probably going to go hard as shit during that squat, mm -hmm. right? And then the next day, okay, you got bench. Okay, you're probably going to go hard as shit on that bench. Do that. Now I'm training guys stronger, faster, more often. What do you think happens at the end of the season? We're in January, February, March, and we cut practice volume in half. That's where PRs are set. Mm. So now that's the time we're trying to win fucking games, right? Like, that's the games that matter. We're trying to win a championship. Why not be the biggest, fastest, strongest team then? Not build all this shit in the offseason. Because you see these great videos of, you know, guys hitting PRs at the end of summer. Great. Summer training went well, guys. But now you're losing all of that with a six-month season. Yeah, you're a few percent worse. Yes. You know, as the season goes on, your strength goes down. I mean, I remember experiencing that playing football. I remember like the end of the season, like trying to, trying to bench or squat or something like that felt terrible. Right. But if you have that sheer volume alone, and once again, it's not like if you do a complex, what is it, 20, 30%, you're just working on movement patterns. You're just keeping it fresh. Um, but the part that I like is now I actually have data to back it up. So we have our force plates and I just take a very simple metric. And it's like what we were talking about earlier. Everybody's got to understand that metric. Okay, Everybody knows what jump height is, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Players are into it. Coaches are into it. I'm into it. But now that I have force plates, I can go into the details of like, okay, eccentric rate of force development, RSI mod, concentric impulse. I can see how they're actually creating that force. And what's really cool about that is now I can look at it from a fatigue management standpoint. And the way we train is when we're in January, February, March, our holistic volume is cut in half because practice isn't as tense. We're mainly doing film. So now we have this huge reservoir of stress or capacity, I should say, that we built now shit, let's just get awesome. Like, we got this big reservoir to actually train hard and heavy. So we're hitting our PRs at the end of season, and it just so happens to reflect in our counter movement jumps at the end of season. I mean, guys are not only hitting lifetime, P or excuse me, season PRs, but some guys are hitting lifetime PRs in March. Shit, that's what you want, right? Like you want the guys performing at the highest level when it matters the most. Yeah. Other than force plates, because you mentioned that, is are there any other like new... Uh, things that you guys use to track metrics on these players? Absolutely. I mean, that's that's the hot topic in sports now, right? It's all of these data points. And most importantly, it's, okay, data's cool, collecting data, you know, getting every metric you can under the sun, but it's the, the real issue is actionable data. Yeah. Like, what are we actually doing with this data? And the example I used earlier, the counter-movement jump, everybody on in the entire program helped. The guy who's washing the jock straps knows what counter movement jump is, right? Good. We can all have the conversation. So it's apples to apples. Now, if I run in there and we have GPS data, so it connects on, we use this little chip. It's basically on their back and they run around and I can see everything they do. Speed, on, on the court? On the court in real time. It's dope. No, just uh, from what my understanding is like some of this came from the San Antonio Spurs. Is that where they, they kind uh, of started some of this, like with Tim Duncan and stuff like that? And they pulled them off the court a lot. Yeah. So that's a bit amazing. I think from that perspective, it was more of like just min load minutes, mm -hmm. right? And for us, it's, look, we just actually want to see what the stresses are. So I can like, now, so you're looking at like jumps and I can everything. see it all. Like literally, I can be in my weight room with my iPad and I can see what play we're running because I can see the <laughs> dots in real time because it's web-based. Yeah. Um, so the co company's called Connexon, but basically it's GPS indoors, which 
has is that's kind of new now mm -hmm. because you could get it outdoors. You can get it with soccer. That's why soccer is ahead of the times because they actually have all these years of data. Um, but now we can get GPS indoors. So now I can have that same apples to apples conversation with the staff. Everybody knows what speed and distance is, right? Like right. any asshole knows that. So I can just go, hey coach, like, or intensity. Here's an intensity metric that we're gonna say is associated with how hard practice was. Here's a distance metric, okay? Today, this is what today looked like, boom. Just like you do in a weight room. Load, volume, same shit, right? So now we're all having the same conversation. Once again, we can get in the weeds and we can look at Excel 3, we can look at you know, D cells, X cells, left and right asymmetries, we can look at all this cool stuff, right? But <laughs> is it actionable? Does the head coach know the data? Like, can he do something with that data? Or is he just gonna go, hey Corey, great Excel spreadsheet, man. Um, don't know what the fuck can do with this. We're still going to run this offense today. Okay, whatever, right? Do do what you got to do. Um, but yeah, uh, so once again, other technologies. Uh, blood work is starting to become a big topic now. Um, it's a great company called Inside Tracker. Mm -hmm. um, really, you just go to CVS or go or not CVS, but like a Safeway, get your blood drawn, and uh, it's a inter, or it's a web based company. It takes, I think it's thirty or some years worth of research, and basically look at your blood specific to a sporting population, not just general populations. Yeah. We're not just getting, you know, here's your T score, like you're 300, you're good. You, and you know, guys like, are doing this with the players right now? So it depends on the situation. Okay. So ideally that's something very intensive, right? Ideally we're not going to be able to say, hey, everybody, we're, we're drawing your blood three times a year. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are a professional team, absolutely. Like, I think that'd probably be the best route. But we do it in in case situations, like certain circumstances that we're like, man, this guy experiences fatigue a lot. Is it just he's tired? No, no, like mm -hmm. magnesium's probably shot. Like we gotta look at some things that could be easy fixes, right? The, the like su from a supplementation standpoint or just from a diet standpoint. Um, no, vitamin D, like we prescribe uh, was it 50,000 IU yeah. uh, vitamin D because the population I deal with we're indoors all year long I don't care that we're in California I mean we travel <laughs> all around the mm -hmm. all around the country so um, things like that yes are cool but you know it's it's really interesting in this day of data is everybody wants to chase that fucking one percent of performance increase and I'm like you're missing this 99 percent of just training fucking hard like, yeah, but the warriors use it. Yeah, right, facts, right? Like, <laughs> right? That's, that's, what, that's, that's what always happens, that's, right? It turns into this fucking race war. Or, yeah, Duke you know, uses it. Right, yeah. And it's like, exactly. then, and then your coach is like, oh, shit, you know, someone's scrambling, right? And right. it's like, well, you know, there's a bunch of different things. Number one is like, well, maybe that guy understands how to use the tracking really well, which that is, you know, who's who's taking this information and doing something with it. And then also too, like there's so many other factors. There's recruiting. There's right. like, like maybe we don't have the right ball players, which <laughs> right. we can track everything we want to track. But maybe we just uh, have too many uh, players that aren't aren't that good. <laughs> you know? I, I call it tracking mediocrity. Like yeah. who gives a shit? Right. right. <laughs> like, yeah. Give me give me some guys that are like your one and dones. Track those motherfuckers. Like yeah. I get that, but you know you got this like affluent kid from that's like six foot tall trying to play post you're like what the fuck are we going to do with that like yeah. it doesn't matter what you do with that kid he's still six foot tall like, like i'm a strength change. coach but i'm not a magician fact you know <laughs> I, chicken shit to chicken salad I, I use that with my staff all the time so what i tell my staff as far as recruiting i'm like whatever you recruit think that's already the best version of themselves and whatever i add on top of that great but don't make me the transformation guy because if you make me the transformation guy you're going to fail every single time because what is performance? And it turns, and here's another topic, like it turns into, okay, does my guy look good in a jersey? Damn, that's a good strength coach. I'm like, Come on, I guess. Like any asshole can take a gold guy's tricep, man. Fact, fact. It's, it's like, dude, college, he's got guys. some big ass Triceps shoulders. Triceps are shredded. Dude. Right, and it's like, man, who's, if, there is a, if there is some data that says swole ass triceps or a nice little horseshoe, makes you shoot a three better, then 100% we're going to be fighting extensions so the cows come home, right? But that shit don't <laughs> exist, right? I mean, there's so many other variables that go into it. And if you really like, go to these NBA games, get as close as you can to the players and just look at them. Oh, yeah. And you're going to go, shit, like Kevin Durant ain't swole. <laughs> you know, like... His legs, man. Oh, my <laughs> like God. Sticks. Like, you're wondering, like, how do you not break? Yeah. But yeah. then, like, James Harden, like, nothing against him. Kind of dad bodish, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, and killing motherfuckers like just Emmett crushing. Smith. 
Emmett yes. Smith was like that. I Emmett guess. Smith had some like traps, and that was about it. <laughs> Dude, it was kind of chubby, the rest, you know. Right. Like, it's the fastest. greatest uh, or most amount of yards, anyway, right. running back of all time. So my goal is just to make efficiency. Now it just right. so happens, yeah, some armor building, absolutely. Do I? I don't want my team looking weak. Like fuck that. I'm like no, they're reflecting. Do you have like a swole day, like just to play oh, around? Do you have we, like bicep, we, tricep, uh, blast off day or something like that? We have a swole like month, <laughs> like <laughs> because we're as soon as we come off off season, the last thing I want to do is beat the shit out of joints, right? And the last thing I want to do is be on the court. It's uh, important to let them have fun too, right? Absolutely. Play whatever music they want, kind so of just have at it every once in a while. So what's cool about Stanford is like we're called the farm, right? So now we have our arm farm, right, with the Stanford logo and all that. So we have like six different you know arm workouts guys just choose whatever they want to do but i let them have the autonomy to do whatever they want because that's the shit they want to do right they yeah. want to look hey it's, it's tank top season year round in basketball you feel me like everybody wants to have some arms like, that oh wow there's harden wow that's awesome he's <laughs> like i don't care he's like i don't give a shit i'm, I'm getting paid <laughs> how, <laughs> how often do you let your guys like choose because like when you Ooh. think a lot of strength coaches right yeah they're like even when i was playing soccer right my strength coach he would give us benching and squatting or whatever right we do that maybe three times a week but we we don't have choice right we do this and we do this weight like how often do you give them choice this is like my favorite question <laughs> you have no idea because in january february march where it's time to win uh-huh that's where i give them the most autonomy there's a neck up perspective that a lot of people miss like look don't get me wrong we can read you know super training we can lead, we can read all these books that tells us what the hell happens yeah right but if the intention is not there I don't care what French contrast method, I don't care what, whatever you do you think is working, it ain't working if the kid doesn't think it's working. So for me, like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna force you into this box of you're gonna front squat because that's gonna make you better. When that kid really wants to do like a trap bar jump, you know, something that he feels is gonna make him better. Once again, I don't even track loads. I mean, I track them at the end of the session, but I don't say you have to hit this certain load. I don't say you have to get somewhere. All I do is say, hey, here's a hip flexion pattern. You choose what hip flexion pattern you wanna do. We're going to track that over time, but I don't really care what you get to. But here's the tendo speed we're going to have it at. The only thing I have control over is I want you in a quote-unquote zone. So move that shit at strength speed, speed strength, absolute velocity, relative strength, whatever we're working on that day, but you choose the pattern. That just makes sure they're not being lazy. Exactly. Yeah. And, amaz and what's amazing is, look, I, I think I'm an okay strength coach, right? But when you're seeing counter movement jump heights increase as the season goes, it's not me prescribing loads. It's not me saying, oh man, on this day, like we hit 87% at you know 1.0 meters per second. No, it's not that. It's the kid said, fuck it, I get to choose that. I get to move it however I want, as fast as I want, and I get to pick the load. And then all of a sudden you just see action, right? You see, yeah. oh man, this counter movement jump just, height just got higher. That wasn't me. I, I always give them the, you made yourself better. I didn't do shit. Mm -hmm. I created an environment so that you can go do that shit. Now, once again, you have your shitheads every once in a while, right? So you got to earn the right for that autonomy, yeah, right? So my, you know, my upperclassmen, basically, they can be autonomous almost all year round. Um, well, in season, off season, mm -hmm. fuck you. No, it's my time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we're riding some, some horses hard, but when we're in, we're in season, you earn the right to have autonomy. You earn the right to train hard by yourself, or well, not by yourself, but like with your own intention, like with your own intuition, because. This is the biggest fucking crime I see in strength and conditioning, especially in college, is kids leave not knowing how to train themselves. They're like, well, where's my, where's my sheet at? Like, I don't know what to do, you know? Like, I don't have my sheet. Coach, can you send me a sheet? No, motherfucker, you gotta pay me now, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's what you generally see, but my guys, like, I let, man, they send me workouts. Like, when they go home, I'm like, hey, I just need to see this at least, right? And the shit that they come up with, I mean, it's basically everything that I've already taught them. So now they actually know how to train. Mm. Man, that's life, that's set skills for the rest of their life. Yeah. You know, I send, they take their brothers to the gym with them. Hell, I seen, I had one kid take his mom to the gym with him, right? And they're doing kettlebell complex. And I'm uh -huh. sitting there like, bro, you taught your mom how to do some, some serious swings. I was like, man, that's, that's love right there. Like that, I can't imagine any other sport performance program that, that like to me, that's the goal, right? I just created lifetime habits so you can be successful. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Man, that now that hey, you got is this crazy. Uh, crazy thing where you throw a kettlebell back and forth. What's the deal with this thing? Man, all right, so what's that like a thirty pound kettlebell, bro? That's one twenty four like right there. <laughs> yeah, that's one hundred twenty four kettlebell. We're flipping back and forth to each other. Now that gentleman, his name is Michael Castro Giovanni. Right, he's like this, he's like a journeyman, if you will. Um, but he developed this really, or he <clears throat> systemized this idea of kettlebell partner passing. Mm. And I have a very, really, really dope friend. His name's Tony, but. 
very psychedelic, if you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. um, but just unbelievable human being. And he introduced me to this um, probably a year and a half ago. And then, you know, I thought it was like a, a novel thing, right? I was like, oh, okay, meatheads, we're circus act. We're just throwing, you know, this is kind of cool. Didn't really think of it from a stress response adaptation aspect, right? And then I tore my Achilles in November and I was like, shit, like, I, how am I going to reverse engineer this situation? Because the number one thing I could not do, obviously, with a torn Achilles is I could squat. I worked up to squatting, deadlifting, but I couldn't do anything dynamic. Mm -hmm. I couldn't sprint. I couldn't jump. You know, I couldn't get off the ground. So how am I going to create the same loads, the same eccentric rate of force, the same impulse that will allow me to that I experience with counter movement jumps or sprinting? And I was like, holy shit, like this throwing of kettlebells back and forth to each other. And there's this unbelievable neck up aspect, the reactivity, you know, the connection with one another. Like, I mean, I've, I can see, you know, quarterbacks and wide receivers doing this before a game because there's this heightened state, mm. right? You can't create that heightened state with another partner before game day or right before you hit the gridiron or right before you hit the court, right? How do you create that heightened state? Because, yeah, that's a, we're throwing a 203 pound kettlebell back and forth to each other. Like, you can fuck each other up pretty quick if you ain't doing it right. Yeah. So now there's this heightened state, right? There's this focus that you wouldn't have normally that you see in a warm up. I mean, you watch basketball warm up, warm ups, Jesus Christ, man. They're going through like layup lines, like all lackadaisical and, you know, whatever, which is, don't get me wrong, like get loose for the game. Mm -hmm. But what truly gets you hype or, a uh, uh, heightened sense and a focus right before tip off nothing yeah so to me it's like almost like a blend of getting out of the weight room a little bit and working that neck up aspect but yeah for me as far as remodeling my tendon like achilles tendons like basically they're so strong they can lift a fucking car right so how am i going to create that kind of impulse to remodel that tendon mm -hmm. because at that point it was it looked like a forearm back there like, it was just fat yeah so as soon as we started doing those throws, I mean, within two weeks, all of a sudden that tendon got a little thinner and a little thinner, and it just started becoming a lot more pronounced and prominent. I was like, oh, something's happening downstairs. Mm -hmm. It's because I'm actually giving it the load to remodel properly. Yeah. How do we repair, uh, you know, from an injury? You know, uh, a lot of people that are listening to the show, they've had muscle tears and things of that nature and stuff that I've learned from uh, guys like James Smith. I used uh, strength aerobics. Okay. Uh, I believe, which is from uh, Vershansky, I mm -hmm. think. Yep. And uh, I used um, some eccentric loading, and um, I healed up fast. It worked really well for me. What are some suggestions that you have towards something like that? Man, to be honest with you, it's more of intuition than anything. Like, I didn't hire a PT. I didn't. I did all my own rehab. Now, obviously, I have a little bit more of a knowledge base than your general population and understanding the human body. But, I mean, everyone knows their pain threshold. Everybody knows, like, okay, if I'm going to walk and I'm pushing off the ball on my foot, well, how do I reverse engineer that so I can do it? Mm. All right, so maybe I need to do some ISOs where I'm just, like, literally working on shifting weight to the, bo to the um, ball on my foot. Start there. And once again, it's like, look at the end goal, reverse engineer it. And what you generally see is, like, you see in these PT clinics, it's like, all right, here's like your abduction, adduction, here's your band work, here's all this. And it's like, don't get me wrong, that shit's great. But like after, if you're training, if your rehab doesn't start to look like training really quick, yeah, then you're not doing rehab. You know, rehab is the initiation, right? Like you're doing like some isolated stuff. I get that, right? But if you really want to remodel tissue and get the nervous system to do its job and to reconnect, that shit's got to look like training really soon. Yeah, I tore my pec on a Sunday and on Monday, James Smith said, you got to go in and bench. 100%. And legal. I was like, I don't know if I can. He goes, yeah, of course you can. He's like, with the bar? He's like, anything's possible, you know? <laughs> and so he's like, you know, put the bar on there. And then he had me do, you know, some other movements in between and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, it worked great. And I just, I progressively added weight and he just kept kind of sneaking stuff in there. And before I know it, like 30% turned into like 40%. Right. And then I was like. Oh my God, like I'm at 80% and like today's going to be heavy and I have no idea if my pecs healed or not, but here we go. And it was totally fine. That's amazing to hear because I mean, we like the, the power lifting, the, or the weight lifting strong man, like these guys have already had shit figured out for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And the problem is like, don't get me wrong. Research is important, but if we wait on research, it's going to be 20 years before we're like, oh, man, maybe you should do some active pushing <laughs> as soon as you get hurt, right? For instance, you just put the bar in your hand and start moving it. That's not a meathead thing. No, there's that, that makes all the sense in the world because you want to remodel that tissue as soon as possible. If you let that sit, 
You can think about the scar tissue. You can think about how this muscle is not going to do what it's supposed to do from a neural aspect because you destroyed it to that point. And now you're just going to sit on it. Now you're just going to let it heal in that fucked up state. That's what they always tell you. Right. They always tell you not to move. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> literally the dumbest thing. Like, I mean, hell, like before I, or when I tore my Achilles, I literally just threw a boot on and started moving because I know I needed to keep locomotion. I like think I, a, a lot of lifters don't understand that a lot of movement is is uh, restorative. You know, it's, it's for restoration. It's to recover. Absolutely. It's almost to like prep you for the next workout. So sometimes you might go in and I, I like your concept of kind of the one exercise a day type of deal. I know there's other exercises in there, but one main focus of the day. Um, I've been doing something similar for years. Now, sometimes I, I go overboard with the assistance stuff too, but Typically, the way that the west side barbell method is set up in the conjugate system, yeah, you go bonkers on one thing. Yeah. You kind of go for it on one thing. And then uh, when you're done with that, you finish up with three or four other movements. And those three or four other movements, they're meant to be done kind of passively. You're not trying to uh, break a world record on dumbbell tricep extensions. You're just <laughs> right. trying to get a lot of... And somebody will say, I can't do tri dumbbell tricep extensions. They said, yeah, of course you can. You ever try it with five-pound dumbbells? And like, no. Right. Like I was trying with the thirties. Well, well no try shit. a weight that doesn't hurt. <laughs> right. Right. You know, like let's try to, but when you go through exercises that don't hurt and you kind of, uh, have a good pace, I mean, now you're building up some conditioning, you're building up some connective tissue, you feel good, you feel like you're worked hard and you're in and out of the gym faster even. Absolutely. And even on that topic alone is, you know, especially working with basketball players, I deal with really, really messed up bodies as far as look, they're a good quote from my good friend at Texas, Daniel Roos. He says, they are giraffes with clown shoes. Like, this is essentially what we train. And I was like, damn, that's <laughs> so accurate. Like, that is like the most beautiful example. So if we want to train with that type of volume, <laughs> see, you guys like that shit. <laughs> it's starting to settle in now. Okay. But um, you got to have these regression models set in place, right? Like, don't get me wrong. Cleans and snatches are amazing, right? I was a purist in the beginning. Oh my God, every one of my guys did that. Like you wouldn't believe. I think that's how I initially got quote unquote validated as a strength coach is because I had seven foot dudes snatching and they look damn good, right? Mm -hmm. So in the back of my head, I'm like, yeah, man, fucking, I'm a good strength coach because I can do this shit. In reality, probably like, until I had force plates, I was like, fuck, what was I doing? <laughs> like, don't get me wrong, it was good. Like they did it with good form, but it's like, yeah, you got 60 kilos in your hand, sweet. Like that doesn't mean shit if you're trying to actually get a response. Mm -hmm. So now I have to, regress these models so we do a lot of variations that we just take a trap bar and do the same type of intent so for instance we're all familiar with the clean you pull it the same you catch it the same the only difference is you don't manipulate the bar around your uh, around your body and catch it in this awkward phase right with this wrist extension yeah so now i just hijack the system to be able to get awesome really really fast and these guys are moving weights like 20 to 40 kilos like experienced lifters they're moving 20 to 40 kilos more at a faster rate, yeah. why would I just go down that path of just, so going on to what you're saying, you can start wherever you, you can have your end goal in mind, but don't be afraid to regress and you can get heavy on regressions. Like you can train it well. Just for instance, my guys, they gotta manipulate their center of mass and they got these long ass levers and that's going, that's hard, that's hard. But day one, when they come in and we, we deadlift for the first time, they're deadlifting with 203 pound kettlebell. To them, they're like, no way I can even touch that. I'm like, bro, get the fuck, stand over top of it manipulate the, now, hey that's how you manipulate a load mm -hmm. now this is you you are taking your levers and using it to your advantage i don't care how tall you are now we put a barbell in your hand with 203 pounds oh it's a totally different story no wonder why your back hurts right mm -hmm. but my goal is yes i want to get them doing complex patterns but more importantly i want to get them strong as fast as possible so sometimes you got to hijack and regress those complex patterns so that you can train more often. And once again, going back to rem like tissue remodeling, like if you're hurt, just regress it. Like you were talking about, just regress it and do the same thing. It doesn't have to necessarily come in the form of a barbell. Louis Simmons has a great quote. He said, uh, the only thing Olympic lifting's ever done is made some fancy shoes. <laughs> Which by the way, God, I can't squat without him. <laughs> yeah, I put myself in that mold, but he's a hundred percent right. I mean, oh my God. there's a lot of he's things funny. that I like about it. Yeah. There's a lot of things. I mean, well, and, and I, when I've done seminars and stuff, I'll ask people, I'll say, uh, you know, he, who in here has lifted uh, 400 pounds? And a couple people put their hands up and I'll say 500 pounds. And then, you know, a couple hands go down and now a couple <laughs> other hands come up. I'll say 600. That's usually about like where it stops. And I'll say, okay, well, what lift was that in? 
and they'll say it was a deadlift. Right. And I'll say, okay, so it wasn't in an overhead squat and it wasn't in a clean and jerk and it wasn't in a snatch. And so my point is not that, not to uh, demonize those exercises, not right. that you would never do those exercises. Uh, different people have different reasons to utilize those exercises. But the point is, is that through the bench press squat and deadlift, they're called the big three for a reason because you can handle the biggest amount of weights on them. Right. And that has a lot of value, as you just pointed out, like doing a trap bar deadlift. What a great, like who can't, I mean, who can you think of that can't do a trap bar deadlift? No one. And Literally then who no can one. you think of that can't do a snatch? Right. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Including me. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's uh, what's beautiful about the Olympic lifts and the reason why I use them at like lower, like more extensively, not like CrossFit by any means, but like, you know, just teaching them the movements within a complex is the motor learning at is the focus and acuity to execute such a complicated movement even though if it's at lighter weights but for me that's my readiness testing right anybody can grind out you know some squatting benching and deadlifting which is totally fine right. but hitting a very complex movement like a very intricate movement if that bar path doesn't look good one day and complex you know something's up or they're constantly re-gripping that bar you're kind of like mm, nervous system shot like what's going on and they're not hitting that bar pathway that they normally hit you're like i don't need a heavy load to tell me that because you can like trust me you got your white walk on so you can grind the shit out of that stuff right they're like Argh! yeah and i'm like dude like, you're not going to play it doesn't matter <laughs> but like you got your guys who who are so neurally driven it's like dude like i gotta have something that i can tell your story not by grinding you through something to put you in the hole more so once again, training it extensively, like, yeah, snatch complex, like, fuck, no one's going to get hurt during that. Did you say white walk-on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you cut yeah. that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it took a second to hit me. I mean, I'm still <laughs> thinking about the fucking giraffe with the clown shoes. <laughs> I'm like, white walk-on. Yeah. Well, there's not, well, let's just be like, okay, in the college basketball game, like, there's not many other walk-ons. <laughs> it's because they're sitting beside me. Hey, look, Duke <laughs> plays with a lot of white guys, and they they still win championships, right? Mm, it's shifted a little bit lately. <laughs> uh, yeah, they got Zion, who's like just Bro, out freak, of this world. Freak, man, freak. I mean, That's crazy. I'm it's excited like, to see his development. Yeah. I mean, he's like a he's a dad bod that flies through the air like you wouldn't believe. And I'm like, a dad bod? Oh yeah, he he ain't like he ain't like. For instance, if we were to look at the number one metric that determines true, like jumping capacity is lean body mass mm. the leaner you are the higher you can jump period right this guy's holding on to some extra weight if he was like and he will get to that i'm assuming at some point in the nba yeah. he will get lean and he, Remember he like blew scary. out of his shoes yeah <laughs> he will be scary as he fun. blew out of his shoe he did you ever see that yeah i saw that <laughs> that, was wild. I saw that shit was gnarly that shit was really what kind gnarly. of athlete can do that blow right out of his shoe bo jackson never even did that <laughs> In that case, like sign this kid up. <laughs> like, you're gonna have to do some special testing on him. What a mutant. Yeah, fact. You know, it's crazy because you. I don't know how many athletes are on the team that you work with, mm. but you know, you mentioned the uh, the giraffe with the clown shoes, right? Yeah. You're working with like 20 something of those, and I think basketball is one of those sports where, you know, we look at a group of soccer guys, yeah. right? They're close to the same height. They're not super tall, not super small. They're pretty average. Mm -hmm. But basketball players, seven feet. You mentioned the seven two wingspan. You're dealing with a lot of different types of bodies. Yeah. So with that being said, how do you maneuver working with all these different players in a group training type of setting oh, and specifying like what to do to help each of them progress? Right. How do you how do you do that? So everyone starts at the same place, you know, and that's where like, I utilize the shit out of kettlebells. Because kettlebells are easy to manipulate, easy to teach, mm -hmm. and easy to repeat efforts. And I can get them pretty heavy pretty fast, right? Well, you mean like uh, easy to manipulate in the sense that it's like uh, almost a little bit more idiot proof? Like Very you can, much learn, more you can learn how to lift on it quicker. Absolutely. Got and, it. you know, the barbell, you have to, like, for instance, we're, let's look at a, like a swing compared to a clean. Now, obviously, it's two totally different force vectors and all that, and I totally get it, but for, compl or for simplicity. If I have to do a clean, I have to manipulate that bar around my knees, right? Mm. But if I have a kettlebell, it's in my center of mass. So mm. that's super easy to manipulate because, I mean, that's the goal, right? If you want to lift the heaviest weight, you got to put yourself in a position. Got balls over it. Bingo. <laughs> balls are just dangling over, right? So like, that's how you, basically that's how we teach it. Um, anyways, what was the question again? Was, oh, yeah, the, uh, the group training aspect. Yeah. So everybody starts on the same deal, right? But you progress through basically like an award system or a graduating system. Um, so when you come into like one of our microdosing sessions, you'll see a prescribed pattern, right? Here we're doing hip flexion. 
but you'll see 13 different squats, mm. right? And some of it's based off autonomy and some of it's based off limitations, right? So that's why I'll use the athletic training platform from Westside. I love that thing um, as a belt squat because shit, these dudes long levers, right? Last thing you want to do is put a bar on their back in most cases, especially in season. So I can now, their limiting factor is their upper back strength. Now I just hijack that. All right, we're just going to go downstairs. I want to load the shit out of your hips. We'll put a bar on your back still so you can work on the pattern and build that upper back strength in time. But I could load it light up top but heavy as shit down low. Mm -hmm. So now, hey, that's a great squat for him, right? So that makes a lot of sense. So if you were to load someone up with like 315 because they're a giraffe with clown shoes, <laughs> they might be moving all over the place. It might be sloppy, and they might be kind of dumping the weight into their lower back and mm -hmm. causing all kinds of problems, maybe even hurting their knees. But if you go on a belt squat, now they can hold the thing in front of them. Well, the one that we have has something in front of you. Mm -hmm. But they can uh, kind of sit back into the squat more, maybe sure. not uh, cause any damage to the knees. It may, that makes a lot of sense. And there's not a lot of teaching that goes on with the belt squat. Yeah, it's amazing, right? It's just, it's just it's, like maybe they might have to move their feet around a little bit, and that's about it. My goal, honestly, with most of my guys, and this is what we were talking about earlier, like where do I start with them? I mm -hmm. start with them in every self-limiting exercise as possible. Example, like a belt squat. You can't really fuck that up. It's pretty tough to fuck dragging that up. Dragging a sled. <laughs> Drag, yes. Can't mess it up. Can't mess it up. Pushing a sled, dragging. Beautiful example. Um, one of my favorites is a bottom-up kettlebell press. It's really hard to mess that up, right? Pressing overhead. And like, it's difficult. It's a true press, though. Like, it's truly a true press. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be stacked for you to actually execute it at a high level. If it don't, then it falls and you go, fuck, I suck, right? And it's like, okay, that's your pass fail. So the more self-limiting or pass fail strength exercises I can give them, not only do they learn intuitively, like, oh, this is what it's supposed to feel like. Because, I mean, you've done squats for 30 years or whatever, right? You've changed significantly, right? And your intent and where do you feel X, Y, and Z and how do you, oh, okay, I'm going to break early here. Like, this has changed. Like, some, right. some small shit like that. You did that. Not like a coach may have gave you a cue, but that intuitive action is like, oh man, like now you taught somebody how to train. You know, you can give somebody self limiting exercises so they can learn from their own mistakes, opposed to me, it's just, all right, guys, every, everything's perfect. It's here. It's here. Like you can look at a perfect squat. Something can still be wrong intrinsically, 100%. But once again, I don't know that. It's a good comparison for them. Like, why do you lean to the left when you're, you know, the guy's putting pressure on you this way and they're like, I don't know. I've just always done it. That's the way I'm able to get enough separation to score. Right. And it's kind of like what you're saying with the squat or with uh, Nsema doing like jujitsu or, you know, whatever you're practicing and you start to learn, you start to, yes, you have a coach and you have a mentor and you got someone that's working with you, but you start to really learn it yourself. Right. And, and those guys are masters on the court because mm -hmm. they've been doing it for a minimum of 10 years probably. But the weight room's not always their thing, right? And I'm so glad you brought the jujitsu aspect because that's literally where we start. I'll take everybody to the wrestling room and we do jujitsu partner training, low level gymnastics, tumbling drills. We learn how to be a good do, athlete. Do you first. think aside from like, you know, what that's doing uh, in another sense, do you think that's just building like some community? I mean, getting that close to somebody else like that is like a, it's a tough thing. A hundred percent. It's a like, tough thing to like get over, right? Well, they're close to each other in basketball, right? You're posting right, up right, and right. like, but they know that world. Right. But this is like you're kind of like, yeah, you're um, like fighting each other almost. Kinda, you know? so essentially, we do everything but the combative aspect. Right. right. So for us, like I just and, one, and I misspoke earlier, we make the uh, my goal is to make them better humans before I make them better basketball mm -hmm. players or better athletes because they suck as humans as far as from a movement profile or a physical literacy standpoint, because, man, they're six foot eight and they live in a five foot ten world. Yeah. So they're fixed. I mean, their hip flexors are shit. Their backs are shit. Like, and you wonder why, right? It's because the world they live in. So now I got to basically take them through childhood development all over again. And so we start in the wrestling room, right? Shoes off. We're all in there. And we start literally from the ground up. It's like little kids beat the shit out of each other. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But like these kids, like think about it. They play basketball. They play on a hardwood surface. Mm -hmm. right? They get knocked down to the ground a lot. Have you ever watched a basketball player fall? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, atrocious. Like there's nothing smooth about that shit at all, right? It's like someone falling down a set of stairs. It's, it's ugly. And that's where most injuries happen. So what if I gave them the toolbox that they can actually learn some falling progressions? Now they know how to absorb the ground, not just through their feet, but they can dissipate and go through their entire body. So maybe I hit that right foot and then roll over to my left hip on my right shoulder. Boom, I'm popping back up. I'm in an athletic position, 
right? Just low level tumbling or, yeah. Gen- or um, yeah, tumbling. So if I can give them those tools, I mean, I'll never forget this. When I was at UAB, I had this kid from Africa. He gets, uh, he takes a charge, right? Most kids put their hands behind them. And that's how you see fucked up wrists, right? This kid goes right into our volleyball roll progression and just boom, pops up on his feet and then looks over at the sideline. It was like, ah! <laughs> and I was like, you didn't dunk, but okay, that works. Like, that's dope. Like, but that was a movement strategy. Who knows? He could have fell back on that wrist and shattered his forearm. I don't yeah. know. But we're learning these strategies that help them be like more resilient and more durable. And it ain't necessarily through strength. It's through giving them more physical literacy to be able to basically figure it out when they're in that screwed up situation. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's the shit I'm talking mm. about. Oh. Now they mentioned that like uh, with, with kids, you know, it's really important that they do a lot of different stuff. So it sounds like, uh, you still think that that's valuable even with these guys who are a little older. I mean, they're, some of them are still like teenage years and, uh, in their uh, low twenties. Right. Mm -hmm. But do you, you think it provides a lot of value for them to have them doing some other things? Well, we're in that day and age now of specializing super early in Mm -hmm. sport, right? Kids are getting stuck in AAU from the age of 12 all the way to 18 without playing any other sports. So they constantly play in this hip flexion position, never really get into true extension, and they never interact with the ground like in other sports. So, yeah, I got to make them better humans first. Like I need to give them such a physical literacy. I have to go back in time to give them the things that they've lost through childhood development because they specialize so early. And you wonder why you're seeing these crazy injuries these days. I mean, you got guys like blowing shins out of their – or bones out of their shin. You're like, Mm. what the – like this didn't exist back in the day, right? And that's also like footwear and some other things that we can go into later. But I mean, to me, it's like if I was to truly develop a basketball player, I would put them on blacktop and I'd put them in Chuck Taylors and I'd say, go play, learn how to play basketball now. Because now you have some self limiting factors, right? Now I can't create and absorb the forces or I can't uh, create the forces that I cannot absorb. Because those Chuck Taylors, shit. You know, I mean, you ain't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But you watch the crazy shoes that we wear now. That's some ISO holds. Uh, look at the shoes that they wear now, and they're able to do whatever they want. I mean, they can heel strike so far outside their knee, you know, and they're wondering why they have patella knee pain, mm. right? Like, come on, guys. Like, it's just it's simple, right? They're striking with their heel on everything. And so if you put them in a situation where it's like, ooh, if I strike with my heel, that shit would hurt, then all of a sudden they're going to change the way they move, and they're going to be in a more favorable position to create load and absorb load so that's what i think is like man let's let's go backwards in a lot of ways especially in our development like i threw it out there for our off season i'm like let's play on the let's like do individuals on the blacktop you know Corey, their knees no 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 i assure you they're not going to land hard because <laughs> they're going to actually learn how to land appropriately in, within their sport we can do all the shit you want in a controlled environment in the weight room in the in the wrestling room wherever we do but until you relate it to sport it, there's not going to be that much transferability, yeah. right? So, yeah. How do you create leadership in the group? Oof. And and do you, do you sometimes use those leaders to mm-hmm. say, hey, man, like, Bell's slacking off over there, man, like, uh, and Seema, like, you know, go go uh, go kick his ass or go, you know, get him get him going, you know, or do you do stuff like that? That's such a, man, it's, <laughs> it's such an interesting dynamic. Little, little mind games in there? I, my goal is to create as many mind games as possible, but the problem <laughs> is I'm playing mind games with low-key genius people. <laughs> <laughs> that's the hard part about being at Stanford. UAB, shit, yeah, man. <laughs> I could play whatever game I wanted to. I could turn up that temperature in the room, and I, I could dial that in and get the response I'm looking for. Stanford, it's a, it's a little different deal. Um, I'll quickly tell this story, and it'll pro- and hopefully it'll, it'll give you an example. I had this one kid. He's actually in the draft or in the combine right now, probably a first-round draft, or probably a lottery, but he's definitely a first-round draft pick. This kid comes from Orange County. Awesome kid, but, like, super reserved. Very, like... Not your typical kid that I would say, like especially a basketball player who's super good at basketball, should be super confident walking around, like talking it, like can't make eye contact, mm-hmm. like just didn't really develop those skills growing up, you know. And it's like he doesn't really talk. And I'm sitting there like, yo, man, like a lot of people here don't think you're, you know, you're into it. Like a lot of people think you don't like being here. Like, yo, like open your mouth. Like, are you okay? Like, and we developed a rapport because I had so much more time with him in the weight room than sport coaches do during the off season because of NCAA rules. So I pull him aside one day. I'm like, yo, look, everybody thinks you got a problem, man. Like, what, what's good? Like, talk to me. Like, what is happening with you? Like, is there something we need to address? So what are you talking about? I'm like, dude, you don't talk. Like, talk to us. Tell us what's going on. 
he looked at me super perplexed <laughs> and he said this shit. He goes, Corey, man, I, I just don't waste words. I was like, what the f you just hit me with some Socrates shit. Like I like he hit me with some shit. And this is an 18 year old kid. And I was like, I waste a lot of fucking words. Like I'm wasting some right now. <laughs> I'm like, damn. Wow. He hit me yeah, with some real shit. There's a quote shit. that says, uh, a wise man once said nothing. Yes. Fact. Let that one sit in your brain for a little while. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's where I was like, you know what? Um, mind games, leadership, all that. You know what? This is going to have to come from the top down. <laughs> this might not come from the weight room. <laughs> uh, you know, looking, I think you're in a really great. cool, uh, you're in a really unique situation because we had the guys from Brand X here. I don't know. Do you know who they are? Mm -mm. They work with like, they do like uh, kids workouts in terms of the weight room and they help them learn how to move from a young age, yeah, right? Yeah. But, you know, you're dealing with a lot of guys that plays basketball, and you mentioned that they're specialized in basketball, right? So they come in. Do you see a lot of, like, deficiencies in this newer generation of players because of the habits that they may have? Yeah, they're playing sports, but they're also sitting down a lot. They also pay, maybe had smartphones from when they were a kid, so they're, like, like this all the time. Yep. Do you see anything special going on with those athletes? It's always the same story. Dorsiflexion shit, hip internal rotation shit, T-spine shit. It's all the big three, right? Every single time. Now, my posture has gotten amazing because of the environment and the ecosystem I'm in. I deal with guys that are seven foot tall, so I'm looking up at them all day. My, my sternum's lifted. Like, I, I got great posture all day long because I have to talk to these guys, right? Mm -hmm. But then I realize they're talking to me too, and they're like this, and it just makes all the sense in the world that, yeah, like, you should be in those poor positions. And so, once again, going back to the human aspect, we do these global patterns where it's like you see in traditional like wrestling or jujitsu, like for instance, a reverse wrestler bridge, right? Where you're laying on your back and you are, so they get them into that true extension. I mean, day one, like these kids can't even get their hands to the ground and they're just laying on the ground, right? With their feet flat and they're just trying to get their palms on the ground so they can go into that overarching bridge and reverse. Can't even get their hands there. And it makes all the sense in the world. So for me, it, it's not about making them a better basketball player. If I can give them the capacity to be a, a human, right, the things that everyone should be able to do, then their recovery gets better. Then their, you know, their uh, getting up and getting out of bed every day is better. Like their life becomes easier. So now I don't have to deal with holistic stress as much as I used to, right? And like okay. you were saying earlier with the recovery aspects, like the best thing, you, best thing in the world is to have a good plan, right? Like fuck recovery, fuck my ice baths. So like, don't get me wrong, those are great things, but that's a temporary hijack because you missed, you missed, prescribed load so what the hell are we talking about recovery when it should be really well thought out training and then it comes from the practice situation too so um but as far as like i mean i just had to get them to internally and externally rotate that hip i got to get dorsiflexion like you wouldn't believe the knee over toe because mm -hmm. that's where they play in right but they're taped and braced all year round right so now their foot structure or that lower leg complex is totally compromised so they got super weak or weak foot intrinsic strength um, they don't have the range of motion, not from a stiffness perspective, or it is stiffness, but it's because of weakness. Mm. So now, I mean, basically every training session and every part of the training session, other than like squatting and cleaning and snatching, we're shoeless. Like I, I get them out of their shoes as much as humanly possible because shit, man, like they got to build that foot strength. If not, I mean, they're going to have the same compromise, but like ankle rolls, ankle rolls, ankle rolls, because just because you put a cast on it doesn't make, doesn't make it strong. Right, that's a that's a hijack, a temporary hijack. I mean, you do that year round, something's going to happen eventually. I hope I answered your question. No, no, yeah, you uh, can almost make an argument that if someone can do a uh, a bridge like you're suggesting, um, or even some of these kind of basic movements that were shown as kids or used to be shown as kids, mm -hmm, maybe they right. don't even show them anymore. But uh, I could probably make an argument that you might recover from stuff a lot easier. And also, sometimes, I mean, have you ever seen, you ever watch a football game and watch someone get uh, like one of those cowboy collar tackles, Oof. the guy jumps on their back yeah. and, 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 and grabs the back of their jersey and yanks them down, and, and it just looks like they blew out both quads. Right. Well, some of those dudes get up totally fine from that. Right. But some of those guys are, are probably people that can go on their knees and probably you know go bring their entire body back and put their arms up over their head and just rest that way, and they're, they're comfortable in that position because they have the... Uh, the body to be able to do it and the mobility. Now, if it, if something like that happened to me, I'm probably going to blow out <laughs> right. both quads. Cause right. it's like, I, I'm really overreaching, uh, my, you know, my set point of, of where my body can go to. 
it's really all about dissipating force, right? So if I can use every joint in my body to dissipate a thousand pounds of force, let's just use that for simplicity, then each joint is probably going to get what, three to five pounds. But if I don't have the mobility or the motor or the strategies to be able to get into some of these positions, then all of a sudden I only have 50 joints or some, especially with my basketball players, 15 joints to dissipate that thousand pounds of force. So now it becomes a lot more localized pressure. And then all of a sudden, ooh, my low back. Ooh, I blew up my, my, my quad, right? And you wonder where this is coming from. It's because they can't dissipate their force through their entire system appropriately. And there's rhythm and coordination and synchronization that goes with that too. So there's a lot of aspects that go into basically manipulating force. And if your hips are tight or they're not operating properly and you're doing squats and your knee kind of keeps caving in, you know, definitely there's possibility that your your knee is going to be more sore than the next guy. Your knee is going to be more compromised or your right quad is sore and you're not sure why. Like, why is my right butt cheek and my right quad right. super sore from yesterday's workout, but nothing else is? And it could just be that one simple thing. And what I always try to tell people is, you know, when you're when you're warming up, there's a lot of different ways you can warm up and you can try to get yourself in different positions and stuff and better positions, but... One of the warm-ups I do is I usually go on a belt squat first. Mm -hmm. Belt squat helps me move a little bit better. I kind of wait until I can squat into a deeper position. Even if I don't do the belt squat, when we do regular squats, I'll squat the bar, I'll squat a plate. And when I squat those weights, I might take them a few times. I might squat the bar a few times. I might squat one plate a few times. I might squat two plates a few times. And I could be squatting, I don't know, uh, eight inches above parallel at first. And then six inches above, I'm waiting until my body is like, all right, dude, you're, you got the, you're warmed up. You're, uh, you're moving a little bit better, but I'm not forcing anything. I'm only right. going to like what my body will allow me to do. And then when I'm ready, because I know like, look, if I go right to four or five plates mm -hmm. and I start trying to move those weights around, um, that I can potentially get hurt because now I'm at the end of my range of motion for that particular day. Cause I came in, you know, kind of stiff or whatever. So and uh, I think it goes back to a little bit what you were saying. You got to get back to the movement that got you hurt in the first place. And I think this is true with your warm ups. You got to kind of quickly get to the movement that you're going to do. You can do a lot of warm ups, and there's a lot of different things you can do that can be beneficial. But I don't think you should be wasting a lot of time. You know, get to that main movement, get to that main exercise, and then get find find the range of motion that's comfortable, and then stick with that. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that's one thing that we've. It somehow, like once again, this wasn't me being smart. It just so happened to work out. Is with our microdosing, we actually do our major lift last. Like I want them leaving with the most strong impulse or the most fast impulse, whatever they're doing, going right into practice. So just so happened how it worked out was in our A series. It's basically a bunch of isolated movements that supports whatever we're doing that day. For example, if we're doing a squat, there's a lot of prone hamstring curls. Right, or Swiss ball curls or any of that imagination, anything to do with the hips. But it's when you get there, you're already like everything's lubed up. You're ready to rock and roll. And then you get you sneak the volume in early. You know, it's kinda like um the, we're gonna come up there and train with you. That's it. Dude, come through. This bro. sounds like fun. Dude, hell yeah, man. I got some I got some cool shit up there too. Um what you're mentioning too is uh this is really smart and um you know, people I hope they're really paying attention because these are exercises that don't really require warm up, right? You know what, exactly. what you're mentioning. It doesn't require any warm up, exactly. And I think that that's great. You know, um, machines are like that. I mean, even if you're, look, even if you're just don't like to think about this shit too much, and you don't want to stretch your shoulders and do all these different things with the bands and different and roll on a foam roll and stuff. <laughs> right. If you don't want to do any of that stuff or you can't figure that stuff out, hop on a machine at a gym and and move around. Like that requires zero warm up. Keep right. the weight super light. Do a set of ten rest a minute, do another set of 10, your body starts to get hot, your arms start to get pumped, your chest mm -hmm. starts to get pumped, move over to the bench, you're ready to go. Do facts. I mean, where it came from for me was I was trying to be like a, trying to be a really bad bodybuilder when I was really young. And so I bought John Meadows mountain dog training, right? And the one thing I noticed before squat days was like prone ham curls, like you wouldn't believe. And I was like, why the fuck am I going to do that? I did it. And, you know, I followed it. And then I went squat and I was like, oh my God, my squat feels amazing. Like I just sink right down. Like I was like, why the fuck haven't I been doing this? This just makes sense. So, and the one thing that I like too is I'm becoming a lot more machine-based as a performance guy. It's like, 
can't believe you just said fucking machines, bro. Yeah. Like you're training with machines, like you a fuck. No, I'm a hundred percent riding that wagon because look, they're already getting all the movements in sport. You know, like I gotta find a way to train t tissue, and I gotta do it in a way that doesn't compromise joints. So I'm not saying like that's what we stick with, but as far as like all your accessory work and getting getting the the quote unquote lubrication, if you will, so you can feel good with your big bang movements. Shit, yeah. I'd miss hell yeah. Like I wish I had more space so I could have basically a gold's gym in there, not <laughs> only for myself, but for my guys. Yeah, you know, we talked a lot about how you're training your guys, and I'm sure we'll circle back to it. But look, man, it's important for you to be jacked. Fact. What kind of training are you doing, buddy? Man, I'm I'm a douchey like I'm like a <laughs> really douchey failed like Guido bodybuilder. <laughs> like I'm trying my best. Um, you're trying just to get that pump for the Jersey Shore. I'm, I'm, exactly, man. <laughs> except yeah, except for in like NorCal, it's like way easier than this in SoCal. <laughs> but um, for my own training, um, to be honest with you, it's been intuitive for the past like ten years, and I've been all the way from an Olympic purist to powerlifting to bodybuilding. But bodybuilding's always kind of been there because it yeah. just makes my body feel good. It's yeah. fun. Like, fuck, I don't want to look like an asshole. So, like, you know, like, <laughs> and what you see in sport more than anything, oh, shit, yeah, I'm looking kind of thick right there now. Um, <laughs> but what you see in, like, it's fucking crazy is you see these strength coaches and they don't look like they picked up a bar. Oh, I know. And I was like, bro, like, I thought, how does this work? So, oh, man, yeah, you caught me on a good day. <laughs> so you don't like it if they know, like, maybe they, they, they apply all this stuff, but they don't do it themselves. Oh, man, it's a fact. Out. Like, it, no, Jesus, go home. Like, <laughs> the guys who don't have a fucking bar in their hand daily in some form or fashion, like, go home, man. Because what are we really doing? Like, that, I'm a big fan of Coach House. I love seeing, like, the, yeah, his Instagram yeah, posts yes. and stuff. He's always doing different shit. He's always, I mean, he competed in a power of the meet, I think, uh, just I don't know, eight months ago or something like that, you know? So, so my, my last... 50, 51, something like that? My last competition, I did a physique show um, in Birmingham. Um, Mr. Birmingham, by the way, uh, won the city title. What's up? <laughs> literally yes. the lowest I, I level. Think, I think everybody already knows that. <laughs> <laughs> like literally the lowest level of uh, amateur body. That but um, <laughs> for me, it's, look, like you got to want to live and breathe this shit. You know, like if you don't, if you just want to be the guy chasing the science and chasing the, the metrics and you think you're doing something once again you're you're chasing that fucking one percent that might i mean it's ain't gonna teeter the scales mm. you know like if you ain't training hard why are your athletes gonna train hard do these guys get to see you train oh absolutely i jump in all the fucking time and do you you probably train more stupidly than you train them fact oh what i do <laughs> well we've, we've done the kettlebell throws believe it or not yeah. so we did it in a, in a team setting and it went really well but obviously it was properly progressed and mm -hmm. you know that's why it was executed at a high level i was really surprised because obviously you're taking you're taking an asset right like <laughs> if we, we weren't in college we're in pros that's an asset like a true asset with a million dollar worth and i'm asking to throw kettlebells back and forth <laughs> one another and it's kind of like you fucking crazy Corey. but at the same time we're in the off season and the last thing I want to do is have these guys running and jumping. But I want that eccentric. I want that impulse. I want to be able to train those, that ability to be fast mm. and to prep it. And to be honest with you, since I've been doing that kettlebell partner passing, I look behind me and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, shit, that's an ass. I'm like, oh, wow, like where did that come from? You know, like, oh, my Not bad. My traps, my, my upper back. Did like, you get an Instagram picture for it for us? You know, I, um, <laughs> DMs later. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I can send one. No, it's good. Um, Building up those glutes. But I'm telling you, that post chain, all of a sudden I was like, holy shit like there's something to this and it's almost like that dan john with kettlebell swings like the what the fuck effect right do like, you do you try do you mess around you experiment a lot maybe something you've heard or something you read and you're like oh shit i want to try this with my guys but let me let me be dumb and let me try it first let so, me kill myself first on it so honestly like that's i think that's where i've gotten most of my following is because i do really crazy shit and like, like i chase like these random rabbit holes um, but it's all but solution based, you know, like I'm trying to solve a problem, not just trying to get likes on the gram, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And for me, like partner passing, that example was a solution to something. And so that's one thing that I set up with me and my interns is like every Wednesday we have playtime. I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's like, holy shit, Corey, what are you doing with these interns down that closet? But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what basically are you these young kids, <laughs> we pick an implement and we just say go. And we just like, for instance, like we use some landmines one day. And then I basically, like in, within my small little world of strength, broke the internet with this landmine rotational snatch. And people were like, what the fuck? Like, how does that even look? You could probably find it somewhere. <laughs> um, but I was trying to think of a way for golfers, right? Because I trained some high-level golfers. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find a way to do some 
true power work in a rotational plane. It's just not just med ball throws and shit like that, right? And so what we did is we actually set them up <clears throat> horizontally to the landmine, or perpendicular, I should say, and um, essentially go from that position into an overhead snatch. It's a regressed movement pattern. It doesn't beat the hell out of their joints. Yeah, here it is right here. <clears throat> Boom. And if you can think for a golfer how amazing that would be. But then again, you can actually relate that to almost any sport, right? Mm. I like that. That looks kind of fun. Dude, hell yeah. It looks like it takes some coordination. Takes a lot some of coordination. And you're just ripping the shit out of weights. I mean, at the end of the day, <clears throat> if you can rip weights and not get hurt doing it, you're probably doing something good for the system, right? Yeah, it looks, that looks, uh, <clears throat> but I mean, it's challenging. This, that, that's my intern, Josh, back at the time. He's now, uh, he was with the uh, Ram at the Kings actually mm. for a bit. Um, but essentially, like, once again, if you're not constantly trying to seek new solutions, then you're just going to set the same program up year after year and nothing's going to change. And everything you do is within your ecosystem and the population that you train. The things I did when I was at Santa Clara, the things I did when I was at the OTC, at UAB, at North Carolina, at, you know, now I'm at Stanford. Like, it's all changed based off my population and the environment that I got around me. One of my good friends came through, his name's Joel Smith, really sharp dude, came to my weight room for the first time a year ago and he just goes, man, this is like a, it's like an old, like a mechanic shop. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, dude, you got like so many different, like weird tools. That's like, I'm like, yeah, it's inspiration. Like at any moment I can look over at the wall and see this, like, oh, that would fix that. Now I just don't have a room with just your bare bones. You just got barbells, dumbbells. And it's like, okay, well, of course you only have one solution. You know, your toolbox is limited. All I, I really yes. like all these moves right here. These are <laughs> yes. great. Yes. So I play college basketball. Don't look at my stats. I sucked. Um, but this is this is like the old Pistons, though. You know, this is I love this. <laughs> yeah, I was oh basically God. beating the hell out of it. That was preparing for intramurals <laughs> when, when I was at UAB. Yeah, I, I honestly like it's it's a joke uh, with our staff because I I used to play in these manager games. So it was the night before <clears throat> our actual games, we play pickup with the other team, right? And so everybody on their support staff, sometimes assistant coaches and their managers, <clears throat> and I always pick up a fight every fucking time. It's always some shit pops off. Mm -hmm. And it's because, like, dude, I'm more meat-heady now. I'm not as fluid and smooth as I used to be. Like, I don't have that pop. Like, that was the only reason why I got a scholarship was because I can actually move pretty well. And so now I just, like, fucking bulldozer. <laughs> Fuck it. Like, just put a shoulder in someone's chest and see what happens later. But it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, training basketball is so much fun. Because I came from a basketball background, but went meat route. You know, so many college basketball That's why coaches, you and Ramsey vibe so dude, much. exactly. He loves, he loves to get after. He, he loves to get a pump. He loves to play, man. He loves yeah. to play. And so most college <laughs> basketball strength coaches, football dudes. Nothing wrong with football dudes. But there's so, like, the, I mean, you know the culture in football because you play football. It's very dynamic and it's, it's very selective, right? Mm. Same thing in basketball, even more so in basketball, right? It's a totally different dynamic. So that's where, you know, you have a college basketball string coach who's actually played college basketball. Like, unfortunately, that's really rare in my field or in my little niche of college basketball, even professional basketball. Mainly it's like some really smart dudes who publish a paper overseas training basketball. And you're like, what the fuck? You mentioned like kind of getting heated, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's funny because I think that basketball just kind of brings that out in you sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I remember absolutely. like as a kid, I, I played every sport. I played, you know, football and a bunch of other things and uh i never really got that mad like you know like i I'd, I'd have some really good battles with somebody in front of me in football and like it was just kind of part of the sport but man basketball can be really frustrating <laughs> guy steals a ball from you or you go to shoot it and like you know he he blocks it but then you're thinking that he fouled you just because right. you're so frustrated right. and, what, what do you think it is about that sport? There's that a lot of trash talking, too. Yeah, yeah. And it's really of, good. Yeah, a lot of shit talking. It's so much more intimate. That's what I like about basketball is, you know, there's no helmets. It's, so everybody sees yeah, each other's yeah, face. Yeah, there's no pads you know and saying? stuff. There's yeah. none of that. And it's super combative. But the real issue, or the real deal is. You never like, feel like it's your own skill problem. It's right, like, right. It's a guy <laughs> it's bumped, all, the guy no, freaking you hacked me, bro. your arm, yeah, you know? Right. But what's cool about basketball is, like, you can go play pick up basketball anytime, anywhere, at any age. Pick up football, that's a way harder to do, right? <laughs> so to me, and it's a it's an intricate skill. Like shooting a basketball is, holy shit, that's like, if you really break it down, that shit's hard. Yeah. But everybody can kind of do it, just with, it just depends on the success rate. So even if you're a football dude who's like, fuck, you just clank the backboard, one out of every 30 you're gonna make. So it feels like if you play, you should be able to make more than you actually can. <laughs> By the way, for the record, people that play crazy defense in, in 
pick up basketball. I mean, come on. <laughs> just relax, dude. No, the dudes that take just charges. Just relax, bro. Those are the guys you want to punch in the fucking dick. What, like, what? That take charges on you. Oh, like, yeah, what yeah. the fuck are we here for? Yeah. Like, we're here to get buckets. Like, we're not here to, like, take, like, yeah. like stand in front of each other. It's a low-key all-star game right now. Right. No one's playing defense, dude. <laughs> yeah, you just, you just block the lane a little bit. And you swipe at the ball here and there, man. I thought we had an agreement. You're, like, all up on my shit. That's funny, because that's me right there. I have no other skill in basketball than playing really hard Good defense. Defense. And that's what I would always do. So, Just get right up on somebody. <laughs> Seriously. It's so, and it's so frustrating. Like, man, this guy's right up my ass. I can't do anything. I can't even Dude, pass the ball. I just want to have fun. I don't want to actually try it. Yeah. Like, stop. Okay, super embarrassing. I actually <laughs> was that guy in a certain situation. So I was playing college basketball, and I was doing an internship at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill <laughs> with the men's basketball team, and uh, which, by the way, shout out to my mentor, Jonas Serration, most amazing strength coach. Anyways, so I'm playing pickup at noon, with you know whoever's at Carolina, and just so happens uh, Jared Hass, who's the head coach at Stanford, who hired me, um, was the assistant coach, and so that dude played at Kansas. He was a baller, like oh my god, he's like he's like a cele- legit celebrity in Kansas. It makes no sense, like it, it's crazy. So, anyways, he's the best guy out there clearly, and I'm the guy that's currently playing college basketball. So I was like, okay, we're obviously checking each other, and so I'm picking him up full court. So I'm like, he's old. So I can wear his ass down because he's going to bust my ass because he's got a really good skill set. So I got to do everything I can to wear him down. So, you know, it's like near the end of the day and he's coming around half court and I'm like full court pressing this dude. Like, what? everybody's like, God damn, man. We're going to <laughs> no, I'm trying to win. Fuck that. Like, this is, a, this is a legend. He's a Hall of Famer. Like, no, I'm trying to I'm trying to get this dub. And he comes across me at half court and his back goes out. Boom. Oh. And he, dro- <laughs> he drops down and everybody's like, what did you do, man? I'm like, I swear to God, I didn't touch him. Literally. <laughs> Since that day, he has not played basketball. Oh my God. So then he calls me when I was at Santa Clara. He calls me. He's like, hey, Corey, do you remember me? Uh, I was like, yeah, Coach Hass, of course. And he goes, yeah, I remember you. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, you're the one that ended my basketball career. And I was like, oh, shit. I'm like, I was really hoping you wouldn't remember that part. And he goes, well, how about you make it up to me and be my strength coach? And I was like, bro, that's sick. So, yeah. <laughs> so you can fuck somebody up and hopefully get a job one day. <laughs> have, you, uh, have you been able to get him back on the court? No. Damn. No, but he did. He does train, though. He does train, so oh, I give man. him that. Damn, he probably was inspired by uh, how hard you were working. <laughs> yeah, uh, that or he's like, Jesus, fuck this guy. Like, I'm gonna make his life hell. <laughs> I get him now. He's he's actually the best. Like, I don't know about like coaching is one thing. Like, it, everybody's a good coach at that level. Mm-hmm. But as far as like a human being, holy shit, like, he's one of the best human beings. What are you trying to do with yourself right now? You're trying to get bigger, smaller. You're trying to uh, lift more. What are you trying to do, man? I mean, all I can, of it, right? I can I can say all of the above, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, for me, I just want to continue going down the solution specialist route. Like, I just want to continue finding solutions for whatever that is. But for me, I want to be as jacked as fucking possible. Like, I want to look awesome. I want to be able to be shirtless in the fucking... Like, I want to do the things that you do. Like, that, that shit's dope to me. Like, why not? The older I get, why do I need to fucking move that way? You know, I just want to like, look awesome. Let's just do this podcast shirtless. Fuck, I'm in. I'm pale as shit, though. Like, this is my only <laughs> issue. Like, dude, like, the lighting in here, like, everybody's fucked. You're going to have to get better lighting. <laughs> no, I'm just going to have to get a spray tan. So. <laughs> um... What do you do with uh, nutrition for your athletes? Because that can be a really hard thing to tackle. Man, great question. Now, once again, luckily I have really sharp kids. I kid you not, in the recruiting process, I have some kids who are telling me things that they're already doing nutritionally that I'm like, damn, that's pretty spot on. Like, good job. Uh, But luckily we have a really good system set for the guys to be successful. We have two training tables, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. We have fueling stations that are available for the guys, have access whenever they want. Uh, Most of that's like healthy ish very very healthy very healthy um now in our locker room eh, it's not so healthy right like, i saw rice krispie treats the other day i was like what the fuck guys <laughs> i get we want them to have calories but there's timing like okay if we do this timing right it could work but they're grabbing it probably at 10 o'clock at night as they're heading out the door and i'm like mm. right sleep's gonna be shit um now with that being said there are certain scenarios where i've actually prescribed like intermittent fasting for certain guys um even some guys with 24 hour fasting um, but it's once again, special case scenarios, um, surgery is another great, um, deal for fasting. Like, um, a lot of research with Dr. James Laval, um, fasting before surgery does all these great, um, or enhances all these great growth properties that help you mm-hmm. heal faster. Interesting. Um, so yeah, this once again, that, uh, thing we were talking about earlier, Prolon, that's something to look into. It's really, really cool, but it's fascinating research. Yeah. You, so you were, uh, let's talk about that because yeah. that was really fascinating. You were telling me about, uh, 
it's basically my understanding of what you were saying. It, it was a way to fast, right? But you get to eat. It just doesn't interfere with your mTOR production or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah, essentially. So like your body doesn't know that it's eating still. So anyways, uh, so what it is, it's a, it's a shoe box, essentially is what they send you with five little boxes in it. And it's what you can eat. It's like tea, soups. It's one little bar. It's kind of kind of weird, but it actually tastes pretty good. Um, but the only reason why I'd even consider something like this is because my applied sports scientist, who's now um, uh, back in the military, uh, brilliant dude, like absolutely brilliant. He's like, Corey. I'm gonna increase. I'm gonna increase your test. I'm like, sweet. Like, let me pull my pants down. Let's get, let's get this thing going. And he's like, no, 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 not that way. I was like, oh shit, okay. Uh, he's like, just try this. He's like, don't train for five days. I was like, fuck you. Like, no, I want to train. He's like, no, no, no. Just trust me. You're gonna gain lean body mass. You're gonna lose body fat, and you don't even have to train. I was like, all right, man. Like, we'll see what you got here. So, anyways, I did this day three. Right. So it's basically your, it's basically a five day fast, but your body doesn't recognize the food that you're putting in it. So your body still thinks it's going through a fast, but you're able to, quote unquote, still eat. Right. So that's the beauty yeah, what, of it. What does everything have in it? Is it is there like fat in there or, or no. any calories so, at all? Or? So it's not it's really very low calories, but the bar has a little bit of carbs, a little bit. But it's like specific types of carbs so that your body, once again, doesn't induce that mTOR. So it doesn't go through that. Oh, shit. I'm, what, what's I just got mTOR? Fed. So basically, that's the that's the big driver of getting awesome, right? <laughs> More you can induce mTOR, big, 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 big muscles. So most of the time, anything that you're doing in training, you're trying to induce that mTOR. Mm. So with um, so but anyways, eating can kind of shut that down. Or no, it can or? increase it. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, so like you know, like um, I mean, basically, you're superficial like bodybuilding stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. have that high insulin spike, right? Hey, anabolic, right? Um, but anyways, we're in day. I'm in day three, and they're like, yeah, you can have a little bit of coffee, you know. I was like, cool. So I take it because I love fucking coffee. So have a little bit of coffee and it was like jet fuel. It was the most, I was mental clarity. Like it was like, you wouldn't believe energy. Like I'm writing this book and I just told, like I knocked out 20 pages like that. I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. But that's not the effect I was caring about. I was like, what about this test? Like, what about me getting awesome? Like, how did this fit into the plan? So finally I was able to refeed. So day five ends, I'm in day six. Okay, I get to start eating. You know, Philly, slowly feeling better, able to start training a little bit. And then I go to bed day day night or day seven, I go to bed and all of a sudden it was like strong like bull. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, shit. Like, okay, cool. Like, all right. It didn't go away the entire fucking night. I'm sitting here like two o'clock in the morning. I'm waking myself up because I'm rolling over and it's like, oh shit, it's still there. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Like it's 10, like I wake up at or eight o'clock the next day and I'm like, okay, like this is like beyond four hours deal. Like I need to call a doctor, right? It's like the Viagra commercials. I was like, something's really fucking wrong here. That happened day or night seven, night eight and night nine. And I'm like, okay, something happened, right? <laughs> now my applied sports scientist, uh, Chase, he did uh, blood work before and after and saw some great results. Unfortunately, I didn't do the blood work to say like objectively how much, but I'm not rocking hard on something for three nights straight like nonstop and not got an increase in testosterone in some form or fashion. So we did the body fat uh, or the body comps with it, dropped 3% body fat, gained two pounds of muscle. I was like, yeah, that's not bad if I'm not doing shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's really not bad. But, you know, it was it was really, I mean, and then my digestion got a shit ton better. So, yeah, sorry. That's crazy. Five days, of, so it's, it was five days of fasting. Did, were you hungry? Cause, or because you the, what's in this box that keeps you Yeah, and what's the, uh, what's the box called? I've so, yeah, it's called Pro-Lon, P-R-O-L-O-N. And, I mean, the amount of research in it is overwhelming. They're using it with wow. cancer patients for cancer research. Like, they're doing it during chemo, and they're not losing their hair. Like, it's amazing what it's doing. Um, and so there's a, finally, there's a lot of money backing it because I mean, think about like big pharma and all that, like who makes money off people not eating and not taking medicine? No one. Right. But it's prolon pro. <laughs> yeah. They got a box. bingo prolon. <laughs> um, but, uh, I'm sorry. What was the question? No, it's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, we were just shooting the shit. No, yeah. I think it's great. I think, look, anything that's gonna, uh, anything that's going to promote or push towards some of these ideas, like. Whether someone tries a, a you know yep, a, a day is. of fasting or multiple days, it's just good to have the conversation. It's good that people are talking about these things. I know more and more people are trying intermittent fasting. I recommend it to everybody. I think everyone should try it. Um, well, it's, I mean, it is one of those things, just like any other diet or any other training program, anything you ever try, a lot of times it's not going to like work right away. Right Now, if you're a lifter and somebody says, hey, you ever try a five by five program and maybe you've been bodybuilding your whole life, odds are the five by five program probably be easy and it'll probably feel great. It probably will work for you. 
Same thing with diet. If you've dieted before and you've tried a bunch of different things, then you can just switch over. Someone can just recommend something to you. You can just all of a sudden jump into a carnivore diet and not have any trouble. But normally, if you're not used to these things, especially fasting, mm -hmm. um, you might have a rebound. You know, you right. might fast for like 24 hours, and then you might eat for 48. Right. It's like yeah. coming off a bodybuilding show. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah it, that it, refeed is real. Yeah. Yeah. You might have some rebound, but it doesn't mean that it's ineffective. It just means that it didn't work that great for you the first time around. You got to get used to it. Right. You know, you mentioned the, like, when you were telling, when he was telling you about doing the five day fast, he told you about increasing your test. So yeah. do you, like, is your test on the lower end or was there a reason for that? No, nah, it's just he told me I can increase tests and I'm like, shit, yeah. Like, just, I don't even know what that means, but I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know where my normal levels were at the time, but yeah. I was like, dude, anything to do that, I'm in. And did he say if this had a prolonged effect or if it was just like right, like right after? Very boom. cute. Very, Very cute. cute. But okay. like you think about it, you go through like a five day fast. I mean, Mark, you just went through a three day one, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is this, and I hate the word detox because that's not technically what happens, but it's like this cleansing of the mitochondrial cells that now it's, you're actually optimizing whatever your is going on in your ecosystem inside your body because you're not processing all this random shit. Like even the air we breathe, like mm -hmm. depending on the pollutants in it, is somehow slowing down. Like you still have to filter that in some form or fashion. So now we're not adding, you know, three to four meals a day set at this, this amount of time. Yeah. Now your body's not dealing with that. It's truly being able to reset, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was like, yeah, I mean, they recommend it once a month. Fuck that. Not doing that. Cause that means you can't train five days out of every month. I'm not doing that. Yeah. But I mean, once every two to three months, I don't see why not. So let me ask the, the training aspect of it, because like Mark, you were training during this three day fast, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Why do they say like, what's the reason for not training? I mean, for me, I don't know the actual reason okay. as far as like why I wouldn't train, mm -hmm. but my the dude recommended he's like, don't train. I was like, all right, fine. But I don't see why you, I mean, I guess you can. I mean, it just depends on what type of training, right? I mean, yeah. in my head, I'm like high volume, high intensity, doesn't matter. I can break my body down because I don't have to perform for shit. <laughs> so for me, I, it'd probably be bad for me personally during my training because I basically just go ham on everything for no apparent reason or rhyme or reason. Just, I just do anterior, posterior splits. And I I'm just pretty, keep it that I'm simple. pretty guilty of, of doing too much as well. And I definitely on that second day, I was like asking a little too much of myself, but I got through it. And I think that, you know, if I was to do another fast, I would, I would still lift. I'd still yeah. train. I think that, um, maybe I would do a little bit more like you're saying, I'd have like one main focus. Maybe I would do kind of a lot of warm up stuff that mm -hmm. was more like almost like mobility drills and some different things to get me to sweat, right. different things just to burn calories and feel good. Just get your heart, heartbeat going. And then I'd probably move into like some deadlift squats, bench or whatever. And I didn't have, I didn't really have any problem when it, when it came to actually deadlifting it felt fine. I think like it's a great opportunity to go back through like some technical aspects of the lift. Right. Like, right. I mean, maybe not chase that, you know, you hit your work sets and it's like, all right, screw it. One by 20 at the end. Let's just, you know, maybe yeah. obviously not a time for that. But I mean, why, I mean, I don't see why you can't, you can get strength right. without having all these substrates that help support your new level of strength because strength right. is neural based. Right. So right. that's where it's like, maybe you don't need those substrates. What about supplements? Any good supplements? Anything help? Does anything actually mm. help with strength? Like, there's, is there anything that helps your central nervous system or your neural drive? Or the, Man, everybody's going to laugh at this one, but it's like the most well-researched supplement and no one's doing it well enough is water. <laughs> like, water is the hugest one and people just screw that one up completely. Yeah. Um, but also like creatine, like 40 years worth of research amazing like why aren't people doing that all the time um five grams before and after like that's super easy but ncaa i can't even allow i can't even give my guys that stuff you know really oh man it's unreal the restrict the the rules and regulations in ncaa doesn't make a lot of sense here's a crazy one for you i could not give them a supplement that was a i think it was a three to one carb to protein ratio so anything like for instance i couldn't just give them a, a scoop of 100 percent whey protein it had to have at least triple the carbs to go with it and i was like why like, they can just go eat a steak or they just go eat a chicken breast. It's the same thing. You know, obviously there's some fat, but I'm like, that doesn't make much sense, but that was the rules and regulations. You had to have more carbs or more protein? More carbs. Yeah. Yeah, I had a three to one carb to protein. Maybe that's so. a muscle milk uh, contract, oh, you know, man. cytomilk. milk. I mean, like you or look at- Or sport, sorry. I mean, you look at a lot of that and you're kind of like, why? And then they finally like changed it. They're like, oh, okay, maybe not so much anymore. And it's like, man, why was that rule even set in the first place? Like, mm -hmm. That just didn't make much sense. Um, but yeah, as far as like, can't give the guys like, you know, uh, essential amino acids, can't give the guys creatine, can't give the guys, 
you know, a lot of things that are just super, like I can't even, no, it's changed now. Like within the last month, I can give them fish oil. You know how long that fight was to get fish oil to our guys? Like they're like, no, oh, uh, it could be dangerous. What the fuck? <laughs> like, seriously, can you uh, at thing. least suggest it or no? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can suggest whatever you want. Like I can say ashwagandha, go. You yeah, know? yeah. But if anybody pops, comes back on me, he's like, oh, Corey, you don't have a job no more. Sweet. Right, right. Wait, so like they would test for certain things? So um, see, that's the really sketchy part, right, is when do they test? Who is doing the testing? Because the university can test. And then the NCAA can test. Mm. Even caffeine. Yeah. I mean, like that. So when um, I was interning at Carolina during like before or after the national championship game, Tyler Hansborough was like, like um, tested extensively for caffeine. Mm. Like too much caffeine, he's out. And it's like, what the fuck? Like that's, that's pretty that's obnoxious, wild. you know? Uh, so that's like, uh, to me, it just doesn't make much sense, mm. you know? But now like, I train, um, world-renowned swimmers and the amount of testing they do oh my god the blood work alone i mean it's like six times a month and they come at random and you have to log in all of your activities you have to tell them where you're going to be throughout the whole month so they can surprise you at any time the, the, i mean it's it's almost criminal how they just treat these girls like they're just like cattle and that's man, that's just got it it's part of the deal right just trying to find people that they that won't get busted, you know? right? Like, right. Let's not test the football team. Let's keep testing these. Uh, man, okay, yeah. Fifteen year old girls. <laughs> facts, facts, man. So it's, it's it's really interesting. But then again, international competition is way different than NCAA. How know? do you train swimmers? That's Great gotta question. be a little complicated, right? Um, you know what? It's to be honest with you, I don't change anything. It just depends on their ability, right? So one of my swimmers is a freak. Like, so it's just like working with any other athlete where you're going to kind of address like, like what are the main issues here? Like, what do you like to do? What do you hate to do? What are you, what are you good at? What are you bad at? Right. right. All these different things. I mean, the number one goal when, um, the, uh, team USA, uh, came to me about training them, they were basically like, look, they both don't like training. You got to help them like, like the training process. And I was like, easy, I'll kill that part. So my number one goal, get them to love training, find ways to make them successful and make them successful very quick. So a lot of objective feedback to say, oh man, look how much better you got, right? And then a lot of autonomy, like, hey, do you feel like doing that? You don't ship, fuck that, that's a, that's a terrible idea. Why would I even suggest that? What do you wanna do? You know, give them the power of like, oh man, like I'm kinda in control of this thing, opposed to someone handing me a sheet of paper and saying, go do these 14 correctives that ain't correcting shit, right? So now we're actually like training, like squatting, deadlifting. I mean, some girls are jerking, like snatching. I was like, shit, man, I couldn't imagine doing this with swimmers at that at one point in my career. Mm. But now I'm just like, shit, like, they've evolved to do that stuff mm. so it's it's really athlete driven yeah it, you know swimming seems like a kind of a hard sport because most of what most of the benefit that you get is literally from the sport right and, and they're always taught that they're taught that from a really young age my wife uh swam for the university of kansas and it's like how do we get better well we just spend more time in the pool mm -hmm. uh but there is a you know a uh there is a point of, you know, diminished returns at some point. You can't be in the pool all day. Right. And so, uh, you know, lifting has its value. Do you just try to just make these people just stronger? Yeah. I mean, essentially That's it's just to the make them of it. globally stronger, but also reverse engineer what they actually do. You know, um, one of my athletes, I mean, they're, they're mainly the freestyle queen of the world, right? So I got to make sure I do everything for that shoulder complex. So, you know, certain things I'm like, okay, if she's a, un like her biggest, um, or her, her success is in her arms. So she's got to pull, pull, pull like you wouldn't believe. So I use utilize like some flywheel training and do some straight mm -hmm. arm pull downs, right? Something that's kind of like it, like similar but different, right? And then, you know, some perturbations like working on end ranges, uh, FRC techniques, functional range uh, conditioning, uh, where you're hitting these ISOs at end range um, so that you can allow more capacity so they can do whatever they do more awesome, right? Mm -hmm. Because squatting this doesn't necessarily go with swimming. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with my sprinter, it does because they come off the blocks. So that blocks is everything. So it's like, yeah. oh, you're a 100-meter sprinter in my head as far as track and field goes. I'm going to train you like a 100-meter sprinter in track and field. So once again, it's just finding the commonalities, common sense more than important, <laughs> and then getting them to have the intent to, you know, want to train hard. I guess also, too, you can think maybe sometimes uh, some athletes, some people work with, maybe they just really haven't trained their muscles in these ways before, and all of it's going to be kind of new. Right. So, and, like, what's wrong with just doing, like, a leg curl? 
Right. Yeah, fact. You know what I mean? Right. Fact. And then they, at the end of the day, once again, you got to come to an objective feedback to say, did you get better? Right. And for swimming, it's obviously the stopwatch. Yeah. Right. And then, so that's a dynamic. Well, it's not really dynamic compared to basketball, but that's the sport aspect. But what about in my super controlled environment, the weight room? Well, at the end of the day, if you're more powerful in any form or fashion or you're stronger, then more than likely you became a little bit more robust and you became a little bit more athletic. I mean, hell, one of my athletes, it's like, here, let's toss and catch, you know, because you're just like, not like watching watching her walk i was like holy shit like chewing bubble gum and walking is is a challenge for you like we need to you know get better at that mm. and so once again it goes back to that aspect we were talking about earlier cleaning up their lifestyle if i can make your 23 hours away from me more efficient and effective then your training is going to be a lot more efficient and effective you know on that note of making everything outside of training more effective how do you drill in better habits into like college athletes because i remember like even my teammates you know stay up late and we'd still be able to perform the next day pretty yeah. well where like our coach would think we're doing all right but if we got eight hours i know that we'd be doing much better so how do you get athletes to actually take that seriously so it depends on the athlete so number one like the basketball team yeah. the number one thing i'm more concerned with than anything is eating like these kids just don't eat like they go off starburst for three days and i'm like how do you live like that's amazing i know guys like that yeah it's like holy shit. and they like they still perform at a super high level so i created this uh group it's called the game train so a group chat and everyone I, I made it competitive where it's almost like everyone's trying to one-up each other on these plates so they shoot me a photo of everything they eat so you got five dudes who are just constantly competing against each other like who's getting in the most calories right now luckily they're all like basketball players there's not really fat basketball players yeah. so calorie like let's just start with calories to begin with and so now okay i'm not worried about you getting fat now if i got somebody that overnight got fat then obviously i'd have to pull them off the game train and do some other things mm -hmm. but now with my um in my pros or with my pros i give them this uh aura ring have you ever seen those i've heard of it yeah big time. sleep tracking yeah. yes big time so once again i'm not going to win i'm not going to help them win gold medals in the weight room but I can help them win gold medals and their ability to have the best restorative sleep possible. So once again, it's got, you, you got to find a way to increase value. It's not necessarily with a barbell or a dumbbell. Mm -hmm. So for them, if I can educate them on sleep hygiene and track it and say, hey, what are, these are things that you want to do before bed. Let's see if you get more deep sleep or more REM sleep. If we can find a way to systemize that and replicate that when they travel, shit. I mean, that, that is going to help them win more so than me getting them quote unquote stronger. Yeah, trying to sleep on the road's tough. Oh man, the I food's a little different. Everything's a little different, and um, even just listening to uh, guys like uh, Matthew Walker talk about you know sleeping in hotel rooms, he said you get half sleep. Right, it's like your brain just like won't allow you to like be totally rested because you're in a different environment. Yeah, and so man, that's you're getting oh, like half sleep. It's like shit. How do I get eight nine hours sleep then? You know, the best part about the Olympic Games is the swimming is the first event. So luckily you just get them in, get them out. <laughs> like, hopefully you can optimize that time you're there, man. Like track and field, I think it's the next, like two weeks later. But like some of these sports that are there for like a whole month and don't compete, that's tough. Like, What's I, that been like to, to go to like the Olympic Games, have an athlete, uh, you know, win a medal and stuff like that? Like what, that must be a really rewarding experience. Well, well, I've just picked them up in the past two and a half years. Right. right. So I haven't actually went, but as far as like world championships, like having them succeed in world championships, you're just like, man, this is kind of cool, right? Like, but I mean, once again, it's like, uh, like letting, letting your, uh, like your pit bull loose on somebody, right? <laughs> like, like well, we're going to mess you up. <laughs> well, luckily for them, they're already good at what they do. Yeah. So I do everything I can to be as like unbelievably humble as possible. It's like, dude, you're going to win with or without me. <laughs> the only thing I'm going to do is try to create an environment for you to just, A, have fun, enjoy the training process so that there's some longevity to it. And if it adds a couple of years to your career, awesome. You know, but as far as like, oh yeah, I cut off three tenths of a second off your hundred meter. No, don't be that guy. There's too many of those guys out there. And you're like, dude, it was a genetic freak before you got your hands on them. Like cut that shit out, yeah. you know? You know, it seems but, that you're doing a lot of things different from, uh, like at least the strength coach that I worked with. Yeah. So this is like vastly different. And you mentioned, um, I, you mentioned his name fast, but you had a mentor when you were talking about yeah. UNC. Yeah. Did he, or did he like, I guess, groom any of this into you or how, how, how did he help you out? He was the, he was the one, like the Yoda, if you will. Right. Because okay. in my head, I, I did an internship, uh, prior and I was like, oh man, got everything. I, yep. Got it. Three months of interning. Yeah. I got the strength thing. Cool. 
And then I'll never forget this day one in his weight room. Um, I mean, of course, like, especially in my world, if you can clean, you're good, right? Like, if you can show off a clean, you're pretty solid, right? So I was like, oh, yeah. Like, he's like, you want to train today? I'm like, fuck, yeah, I'm going to train. I'm going to clean, man. If I can go up there, boom, thought I hit a great clean. He goes, what the fuck was that? And I'm like, oh, my God, I should have benched. I should have fucking benched. <laughs> I fucking knew it. Um, but uh, from that perspective, he was like, he took me to the process of, like, look, there's a quality aspect to this that you've obviously not been – uh, pervy too. Like you, you need to understand the quality aspects of training, and then from that perspective, he made my latitude so wide. Like opened me up to areas of training that's like, hey, think about the best in the world at what they do, right? How can you re-engineer that for your population? So, for instance, I deal with a lot of foot and ankle issues. Who are probably the best people in the world with their foot with their feet? Okay, soccer, soccer you can imagine, but like ballet, mm. gymnastics, right? Like, oh shit, what do they do for training? might make a little bit of sense you know so now it's like oh shit like barbells like what are those like l let's go to this other world and start mm -hmm. still jujitsu like for me that was a huge one just the partner training aspect alone that's where i was like oh there's so much more value in this opposed to just oh, let's get a barbell in our hands like, don't get me wrong that's great but that's not sport sports so reactive and once again like blending iron with that reactivity you can't just go all right squat Right, and then get the neck up component. That's where that kettlebell partner passing came in. Shit, now I got best of both worlds. So I can get heightened state, I can get reactivity, and I can get load that are like speeds and velocity that you see in sport. I mean, don't get me wrong, grinding out a one rep max on squat has benefits. Yeah. But when I looked at my microdosing data from the entire season and I looked at intuitively what the guys did, they floated around speed, strength, strength, speed the entire season. We had small moments of max effort strength. We had it a little bit more absolute velocity, but they lived in speed, strength, strength, speed. What is that? 60 to 80%. Makes a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where, I, or 40 to 80%. It's like, hmm, makes a lot of sense. So shit, that actually was what they do in sport. And they intuitively knew that. We talked a lot about strength training so far. What about conditioning? Like, what do you do oh. for conditioning of these athletes? You know, I think that is a, uh, a thing that a lot of, uh, like uh, kind of wannabe strength coaches miss out on is they are kind of teaching the clean and jerk and the snatch and the squat and they're getting excited to get their athletes strong, mm -hmm. but then the athletes aren't in great shape. And I think that like, um, I don't think you can ever be in too good of shape. Like right. You could, you know, increasing that conditioning. Uh, I mean, some battles are, are harder than others. And the fourth quarter could be more difficult against one team versus the other. So how do you get these guys in shape? I, the one thing I will always do is I'll always remember what it's like to be a player. That's the number one thing. Oh, is this when Isaac messed himself up? Oh, God. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so there's a video that's not shown with that ball hitting him upside the head. <laughs> uh, luckily, he's a tough Australian. This is my Lithuanian. He's, he's a little crazy. Um, he's got the weirdest body, too. But anyways, um, as far as conditioning goes, I will always remember what it was like to be a player. And we did the craziest conditioning when I played at Berea College. Like it was, I mean, obscenely ridiculous amount of volume, right? So it's a sport coach prescribing shit that he thinks works, right? But nothing ever prepared me for that first game because there's that emotional response that will always fatigue you immediately, right? So you go one or two aspects. You go, okay, I'm going to build such a big reservoir so they can handle that, hopefully. Or I go into the sport. And I build out those drills and those practice sessions to be able to truly, specifically get them into the shape that I want. Because what I want is optimization. I don't want stress for stress standpoint. Because, look, I'm trying to get these guys maximally strong and powerful. While at the same time, they got to play a 40-minute game. So you need to talk to the coach about that, right? Oh, 100%. You need to say, hey, look, here's what I think would be great to implement. It'll take a half an hour, 40 minutes, right? Right. And that, but here's why I think we need to do it, and it's important. And then, luckily for you, it sounds like he goes for it, right? That's a great thing about my staff, man. They're, I mean, we, we sit in staff meetings weekly. We go through loads. We go through, like, and that's what I needed something to say what load is, and that's where that GPS data came in. Mm. And I was like, okay, like acute, we can talk acute to chronic, which is a topic in it, even in itself, but probably not an important one. Um, but more importantly, like, what's the end goal? So now I got game data. Let's reverse engineer game, Okay. We got uh, data from a double overtime game against UCLA. Okay, that's probably our hardest situation of the year. 
all right, let's reverse engineer that because I want optimal conditioning. I don't want general conditioning. You know what I'm saying? Because I want them to be strong and powerful and be or work capacity. Let's just leave it at that. Just the most optimal work capacity opposed to just saying, all right, go run the fucking mile. Like what are the sport demands for that? Right. So it's reverse engineering the actual game itself and then being able to be as efficient and effective within your sport. But like my guys should be able to play another game after a game. The only reason why they can't is maybe the emotional stress was so much, like the heightened state, the crowd, all of that. But as far as from a physical standpoint, they should be able to play two games. Is there do you guys do anything in terms of helping helping athletes deal with, I guess, the mental side of things or the anxiety side of things? Because yes. we had um you know, Patrick Patrick McEwen was on the show. Yeah, he was yeah, talking yeah. about nasal breathing and yes. helping you relax, et cetera. Are there any things that you do to, I guess, help them with better breathing patterns and, and in that realm? The nasal breathing to me is like the easiest one to put out because everybody can do it. Yes, there's some intrinsic thing or uh, intricate things that you to optimize it, mm -hmm. but especially in traveling and re resetting, if you will, um, just get in a dark room, focus on our belly breathing, nasal breathing. Um, but as far as like the mental aspect, we luckily have our own mental uh, health performance coach, right? Or that's the, the title that we gave it from our staff. Her actual title is she's a clinical psychologist. Um, but from that perspective, they actually have someone that's not technically associated with basketball that they can go talk to. Opposed to, you know, like, hey, man, like, Jim bro, let's try to figure this shit out. It's like, no, someone can actually, like, with some real legitimacy, help and identify, which to me is the biggest one. Like, identify certain attributes and personalities that you want. Now, unfortunately, at Stanford, it's the recruiting pool is very, very small. <laughs> so the kids that we can actually get in there that are talented enough. Mm -hmm. So it's mainly, like, find the best, get them here, and then we'll figure it out. Um, but from that perspective, that, that's when it becomes a little bit more reactive, which is okay. Um, but from the mental performance aspect, luckily we have someone on staff that can really, really, that, or that helps optimize that for us. Your area where you train people is a little different than uh, the, the general area that they train, like the football players in and stuff, right? Yeah, so we have four weight rooms on campus technically. We have a really, really small track one, and then we have two huge ones, Annex and Ariaga. Um, Annex is where football trains, it's a huge compound. Um, Annex is like the size of a basketball court, <laughs> um, but we have 36 sports. And the one thing I did not want was distractions because I know I'm going to train these guys way different than anyone else. And not in a sense of like, oh, I'm better, but in a sense of like the culture I'm trying to build, right? I'm trying to get these guys to train and lift weights every single day. Like once again, like that's basketball. Good luck. Like that's the one where you're like, fuck, like that's an uphill battle that you'll never get to the top, right? But if I had my own little nook and cranny that is right in the arena, that is right beside the locker room, that goes right into the training room, so it just filters right into the practice gym, okay, now I have an environment that is logistically set up for success. And I can put the exact equipment I need in there to help train them the right way. So I have this small little closet space. I mean, it's it's not big at all. I mean, the ceiling's not even made for these kids. I mean, it's like a low ceiling. So like, there's only a certain area where we can do overhead work. I'm not even shitting you. <laughs> so like, we have to like move some shit so they can do it. Um, but with that being said, it's grungy. It's nasty. Like it was basically a storage unit, um, and it was leftover gym equipment because it's so hard to get stuff out of Stanford. So they say, well, "Fuck it, let's throw it in this room." Um, but I cleared it all out and got my own stuff in there. But what it is, is it's a safe play, place for them. I mean, these guys come in all, like, it's basically, they, they don't go to the locker room first. They come through the weight room first mm. and just hang out. Uh, but it's, like, nasty as shit. Like, it's really not, yeah, I mean, look at that. Like, that is not a college weight room. And, like, that floor, I'm trying to tear up the floor purposely so that hopefully I can replace it one day. <laughs> Like literally, like, that's I think that's really where the kettlebell partner passing came from. Was like hopefully I could just break the floor so they can give me a new one. But if you can look, I mean that space where they're cleaning right now, that's the only place you see that overhang. Right? There's no way they can oh, lift yeah. overhead in there. And I mean that's small little guy, but that's that's a kid I was telling you about um, the first round draft, or it's going to be a first round draft pick. Um, but I mean these guys, I mean like they low key they live in this world where everything's affluent and prestigious because they're on Stanford's campus. But where they train is grungy as shit. It's like a fighter's mentality. Like, there's not even nice shit on the wall. I mean, it's a random fridge in the yeah. back. Um, so I kind of like that aspect where, you know, maybe that is the mental side that I'm training is I'm giving them more of a blue collar opposed to a white collar approach. Yeah. How is it working with these guys? I mean, is it, are you, uh, it looks like it's fun. 
And it's 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 looks like it, it looks like it's a lot of work, but it looks like it's fun. It's honestly, I've never worked a day in my life. Like, okay, no, I take that back. I was a waiter at Shoney's when I was like eighteen, and I, that lasted for like two months. But since then, I've never worked a day in my life because I've been in strength. And so, especially with these kids, I mean, I'm I'm. It's not like I'm having a conversation with a kid. I'm having a conversation. What are with, these movements called? You're, you're, so these guys a, are getting up off the ground like a Turkish get up almost, but just with a med ball type deal. So we call that a 90-90 get up. So if you're familiar with like a 90-90 positions for hip internal and external rotation, mm. to me, this is a human movement. Every human should be able to get up off the ground without, without using, using their, their hands. hands. Okay. And now we found a way to progress it. So we'll take this Atlas stone, which they range anywhere from 20 to 150 pounds. And then my guys who are really good, I just have them go above the head with it. Is, is that, this is this easier? No, or harder, than, harder than without anything? Yeah, way harder. Way it doesn't harder. act as a little bit of a uh, counterbalance. Does this help them also when they're like falling on the court? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's the ability to internally and externally. It's like to um, move their hips in positions mm-hmm. that allow them to drop their center of mass mm-hmm. so that they don't just fall like you see someone falling off of like a a building. Yeah. Essentially, they're just they're lowering their center of gravity so they can absorb that force a lot easier. But if you can't do a good ninety ninety get up, you probably can't squat well. And you probably can't deadlift well. Or if you do, you're just like that super muscle-bound, contractive guy, which that's totally fine too, but that's not good in sport. You know, I needed, I need uh, degrees of freedom so they can have access to do whatever, like change the direction or vertical jumping that they can do. Yeah, you should be able to move a little bit further than whatever is required of your sport. So even, yes. even as a power lifter, it's not great to be, you know, it's okay to, to have some tightness and actually it can be somewhat beneficial in some ways, but it, it's not great. Um, I mean, I've hurt my back before just warming up on a squat where, and that's why I don't force the squat anymore. I take my time warming up, even with just like 135 or two plates, you know, just, just because I'm uh, trying to shove into a position that's not, uh, my body's not ready for. That's really good for your uh, lower back, these kind of butt scooches, Yeah, right? the butt walks. Lower, uh, lower back uh, exercises. And once again, a lot of this, like that V-ball roll, all this, and mm. this is like low level plyos, just learning how to land. Um, and then train it extensively. Uh, so that's that's the type of conditioning we do. We, have, we do like plyometrics on softer surfaces more extensively because mm-hmm. they already do it intensively on the basketball court. So it's a way of just developing like tendon and ligament strength um, and, and the fitness component that goes along with that. Uh, but that's what's so cool about that wrestling room. Man, we go in there, I mean, there's no fear of falling. Right? Mm-hmm. It's so cool. Um, but we actually do a lot of partner work where we're actually picking each other up and putting each other on the ground. Um, all the intrinsic muscles that are involved in that, I mean, that's real, that's real world strength, right? That's like farm boy, like I got a hay bale, yeah. threw it on a loft strength. To me, that's more important than any fixated pattern with a barbell or dumbbell. I love those movements, but I have guys that are like super strong on the court, but super weak in the weight room. So what does that tell me? Maybe there's not that transferability like we think there is. But they go in that wrestling room hmm. and they own the shit out of everyone, but it just so happens to work out that they do the same thing in the basketball court. It's like, eh. You know, maybe there's a lot more to just picking someone up and walking with them for distance or mm. manipulating someone else against their own free will. <laughs> maybe how there's some more strength in that. How does the wrestling work with uh, guys that maybe just don't get along very well? Oh, man. It uh, probably breaks down some walls, I bet, after a while. The thing is, like, you have, in a, in a lot of the partner training that we do, it it's so much more cooperative than it is combative. So, for instance, if we do, I mean, this is where you see some character flaws, if you will, or let's just put character development where we go through uh, this partner training drill where they start off as a group in, uh, in pairs and they start with an exercise. So for instance, like partner rows. So one guy's squatting, the other guy's pulling them up, right? So it's very cooperative, right? Then they have to carry each other down to the other end of the room. Then there's another exercise that's cooperative. Then they have to come, like there's always a travel component where there's a partner carry. If you're an asshole and you don't like somebody, right, you can make that dead weight really terrible, and that's going to make it a lot harder. But no, 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 we have a common goal. doesn't matter if you like each other or not. You're trying to win because there's going to be a punishment for the loser. So now you have some cooperation because it doesn't matter. You don't have to like each other to win championships, right? You just have to be able to co- cooperate to the point where we have a common goal to win. Are these types of, like, you know, training for these athletes i think you you mentioned that you kind of learned this from somebody else or the application from another individual but if someone's an aspiring strength coach and they want to work with athletes yeah. how do they how do they learn some of this stuff because this isn't textbook knowledge here right right i mean not people are trying to put systemize it yeah and don't get me wrong there's there's some good things that are out there but you got to just get your hands in it like i was unbelievably lucky so i was i was i, I had like this semi-pro 
part of my life where it was, I was like Jackie Moon, where I was the strength coach and the player. So once again, the school I went to, I was, uh, I was the strength coach because I had one internship at Wake Forest mm -hmm. and I came back and we didn't have strength coaches at that level. So the head coach goes, well, Corey, you know a lot about strength. You're, you're the strength coach now. So I'm like training my dude, like my, my teammates. So from, uh, so from that, it's like, I had so much experience doing wrong shit, but I was training athletes. So it doesn't matter what level, like I played the lowest level of college basketball, but I think where the real gold is, is kids. Like train these kids that are fifth grade all the way to 12th grade. Just get your hands on people because you're gonna learn through the fire more so than you're gonna learn through a textbook. So in any form or fashion, like yeah, obviously get some strength knowledge, have something to offer to an athlete, but at some point you gotta actually train a fucking athlete. What you see now is just, and it's astonishing, is people that are getting this crazy celebratory status for this wealth of knowledge that they've obtained through whatever, but have never fucking trained anybody. And you're sitting there like, yo, like you're missing the big boat here. Yeah. Like there's this relationship and human aspect that you're, I don't care what kind of sports science you can spit. If you can't train somebody, none of that shit matters. So at, I think the most important thing is Keep like go to whatever level you can get access to and tr just start training. I don't care if it's fucking jumping jacks and calisthenics. Hell, kids are going to get more from that than they are going to get from barbells. So let's get to that. Yeah, I ended up, you know, for a few years training uh, some people all around the country, you know, doing seminars and things like that um, for CrossFit and just for just regular power thing seminars. And by going through CrossFit and dealing with different body types, you know, powerlifting is, is just so different. And the power lifters that would come to me that come to these seminars are so different. Now things have also changed a lot. So uh, over time, things have changed where you get like skinnier people showing up to powerlifting seminars. Mm -hmm. But it used to just be other powerlifters that were right. strong, you know. Um, but by doing that and getting that experience and, 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 um, and then also having a background in just some regular personal training, you really learn the battle that people are going through as they're trying to perform whatever the hell it is you're talking about mm -hmm. and you start to watch it and you're confused because you know how to do it and you think it's uh common sense but you're like i guess i guess it's not common sense just to right. even a tricep push down something so simple you know i guess it's not common sense i guess i have to teach it i have to show people it but by seeing so many different people over the years it really it helped me to kind of decipher out like where were some of these problems, you know, when somebody would do a squat, a deadlift, a bench press. And I saw it, like, unfold, you know, more and more, and it allowed me to really grow and expand. Mm -hmm. With working with the athletes that you're working with, I mean, that is some rare territory. You know, these athletes, first of all, uh, super high-level athletes is one thing, you know, and then also they're giants, you know, some right. of them. And so that must uh, give you some insight that other coaches don't have. And then also coaching um, – coaching a big group like that, you know, so you could go to a, a Louis Simmons and you could go to some other, um, people that have executed well in making people strong, but what do they know about being a strength coach? Probably right. nothing because they probably have never trained a room full of 30 or 40 athletes before that is very difficult. And how do we have, you know, enough bars and weights and, you know, do I have a different group over here? Like, how do I even piece that together? So that gets to be really complicated. So the stuff that you've learned uh, just by being, you know, on the front lines is, is crucial. Facts. I mean, the one thing that I think has helped me in my progression is the more I realize how much I don't matter when it comes to winning and losing. You know, because that's the goal, right? Like, the objective goal is to win games or hopefully not to lose games. And the reason why I came to that conclusion is, look, a lot of, I see a lot of strength coaches, I see a lot of athletes, I see a lot of different programs training. And there's some shit out there that you're like, why? Like, oh my God, why? Like, you watch LeBron stuff and you're kind of like, really LeBron? Like, that's, that's what we're doing? But he's still the best in the world. I still see teams win national championships doing dumb, dumb shit. So what, what is my great program doing, right? So you gotta humble the shit out of yourself <laughs> and realize that Whatever I'm trying to bring to the front lines has got to be so simple so that, once again, everybody can understand and everybody can uh, digest. So, and then you remove that stigma of, I got to clean, I got to snatch, I got to this, I got to that to get someone strong. No, that shit don't matter. Like, what matters is their performance on the court. 
if you work backwards from that, then your answers are going to be in front of you. Now, the logistics aspect, yeah, dude, I got guys from 5'10 to 7 foot tall in the room at the same time. Mm. How the fuck do you set that up? Especially yeah, imagine like, squatting, you know, squatting oh, with each shit. other. I mean, and you think about like the room that I'm in already, right? It's really messed up. What you really turn to or come to find out is you start bucketing guys with similar issues, similar problems. I mean, I got 5'10 guys squatting with 7 foot dudes because they can, they both have the same type of problem. Even though you're short, it doesn't matter. So you're in the same group. Now, as far as spotting, obviously that's a little different. But when you start to find commonalities, then you can start bucketing. And then all of a sudden, instead of turning that it's like 13 different squat, it really is just three, it's one pattern with three different implements to execute that squat. So then it becomes super simple. But at first it seems like super overwhelming because you're trying to individualize all these training programs for all these different uh, levers, if you will. But in reality, you'll end up just start bucketing it really quick. And then at the end of the day, it's do the simplest shit and squeeze all the juice out of the simple mm -hmm. shit. Because people want to rush to the plyometrics or rush to the cool shit that just seems like it looks good. But, oh my gosh, there's so much low-hanging fruit. Like fucking walking <laughs> with your, like taking a dumbbell in each hand that's half your body weight. Walk that for 100 yards or 50 yards. If you can do that, it's pretty strong. So many people can't even do that. Like that's low hanging fruit, you know, hanging on a chin up bar. If you can hang from a chin up bar for a minute or you can hang one handed for 30 seconds, yo, that's strong. What the fuck is strong, right? That's what we got to identify. Strong, a uh, 500 pound back squat, absolutely. Strong for basketball, probably not. It's probably going to teach them how to break and they're not going to be able to move very fast, right? So who gives a shit? So once again, maybe doing more non specific strength related measures is the real goal here. Or is the real identifier opposed to saying, man, that clean looked good. Or that, that 100 kilo, like, sweet. But, man, if I got a guy who can't even do 10 pull-ups, what does it fucking matter? What you got, Andrew? I was just going to ask about um, specializing. Do parents still think that that's, like, a, a good move? Man, they're stupid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll put it to you like this. If you honestly care about your child, you're not going to try to put them in this situation to earn that scholarship, right? Because that's what you really see. It's really this weird, like, selfishness that I think you see where it's like, fuck you, you're going to play football, and you're going to play football to the point where, you know, you're going to get that D1 scholarship and all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's such a fucking pipe dream. Like, if you look at the stats, like, I don't have them in front of me, but if you look at the stats, oh, my God, it's so rare. And then you think how rare it is to get into the pros. Like, that's the part that you're like, what are you really doing? Mm -hmm. All you're doing is setting your child up to – be so hyper focused in one area that eventually when that domino tumbles and it's like ooh that's not happening <clears throat> holy shit how are you going to handle that stress right yeah. you wonder why like kids are like jumping in front of trains and shit you know like that's where i'm like especially <clears throat> in, like palo alto holy shit like you should see the crazy stuff that happens there because i mean all these parents are like ceos of companies and they're mm -hmm. super hyper successful and if they're not valley victorian or their school then oh my god what am i going to do and they go down this really dark place and they don't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, let's have some latitude so they can have different interests. Yeah, does it ever make sense to, like, uh, you know, if, if they are a all-sport athlete, but it's like, man, I don't know, this college is really interested in you for basketball. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, is there, like, a certain age where it does make sense or just... Man, I think I think anything above fifteen and sixteen, you can start going. Mm, I really like this sport. I might need to start hunkering down. A little but leave bit. it up to the kid, essentially. But, though. I mean, that's what I really think it should be. Yeah. I mean, gosh, I mean, as a man, I'm in in strength for 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 basketball at high level. Been in strength for ten years, and the kids that I get that really don't want to be there are staggering because they feel like they have to be there because they're mm. in this situation. It's like, well, I just so happen to be fucking tall. Right, and I just uh -huh. so happen to have some coordination. They really didn't want to fucking be there, mm -hmm. and so you're wondering, like, okay, what, like, what does this even mean to you? Why am I even wasting my time with you? Because you don't even want to be here, mm -hmm. and so like, what, do, what kind of psych, like, what, what shit is going on upstairs that's going to really like fuck with you for the rest of your life when you're in a situation where that's what I identify myself with, but I don't even want to be that identification. Yeah, that shit's scary, man. Yeah, and like, I'll, it I'll, happens though. Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll flip it right on its head. Then what about uh, coaches, like, does it make sense to really like focus on one area, like whether it be strength or, oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, okay. So as a strength coach in just team a, sport, just a, yeah, a team coach in general, oh, like, are you uh, talking about a sport coach? Yeah. Also yeah. Oh, a basketball coach. Yeah. You, you generally, you need to have a niche, right? If you're the all around guy, you're not good at anything. 
You know, so what you see in college basketball is like, okay, I, he's the recruiting guy. Mm. He's the guy that can get kids in. Oh, he's the offensive coordinator, right? He's the, you know, he's the he's the individual or he's the uh, skill development guy. You know, like you need to have that niche. But once again, like you're trying to teach a hyper specialized area, right? But I mean, you'll see. Well, college basketball is kind of crazy right now. I mean, kids' dads are getting hired on staff just so the kid goes to school there. Like really <laughs> crazy stuff, you know. And ev evidently, that's okay with the NCAA. <laughs> But then they're getting on everybody about paying kids. Let me get the fuck out of here. Like, <laughs> that's shit that's kind of wild to me. Um, but as far as coaching, like, it's all about your interest. Like, for me, I was a purist in the beginning, but I realized, like, maybe that's not the way to go. So I developed this latitude. And then all of a sudden, I had all these tools to my disposal to handle certain situations that in the past I would have been like, oh, hammer, nail, hammer, nail. Now I'm like, ooh, that, that, that tool would do something different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Do you think they should get paid? Absolutely. College, college Abs absolutely. I know that's a very controversial topic, but absolutely. Absolutely. Now, when that happens, I'm probably fucked. Like, 100%. <laughs> like, it's going to be bad news for me. Um, yeah. But, I mean, these kids, like, it's, I mean, it's 20 hour work weeks. You know, like, what other kid that works a 20 hour work week um, in, at college or in college doesn't get paid? Mm. No one. I mean, oh, you get that, you get that free education. I get that. Don't get me wrong. That's important too. But if we're really, like, if we're really thinking about this, like Stanford, I could say that Stanford, that kid, you, yeah, that twenty-hour work week's worth that degree, one hundred and ten percent. But if you go to, you know, low major, mid-major school in bumfuck Louisiana or whatever, and you get that communications degree, and you can't even fucking write a sentence by the time you leave, <clears throat> who used who? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And that's where uh, my when I bring kids, or when I was in other schools and other situations. My, my real goal, my real impact was getting them on board with, okay, they're taking advantage of you. Like we're all like, we're all riding on you. You need to ride us, but like, you need to find a way to get yourself in a situation. Cause when I went to school, I, I mean, every, I was at Berea college, the smallest school ever for basketball, like literally NAI, they, I didn't even know what the fuck NAI was mm -hmm. until I got there. I was like, oh, this is NCAA division five, right? And I'm like, no, no, that's not how it works. Like, oh <laughs> shit. But when I got there, in my first summer, I was like, oh, shit. Okay, I'm not playing in the NBA. Got that one done. But I had guys on my team that still thought they were going to play in the NBA year four. I was like, hell no. But I took advantage of that internship program that would pay for me to go to Wake Forest. It would pay for me to go to uh, UNC. That would pay for me to go to Olympic Training Center. And I was able to get some experiences before I even graduated so that I could advance in my field. Shit, that's what all these kids should do. I'm telling you, these kids at Stanford? Amazing. I mean, I got internships at Tesla, internships at Nike. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're doing big shit. I got a kid doing stem cell research, like literally presented on it in DC last week. Wow. I'm sitting there like, bro, like, come, come, come talk to me because I need to learn. Like, you're an amazing human being, but that's not everywhere. Like, that's, that's like one or two schools that are really doing that, that you can truly take advantage of that. And that's where I'm like, yeah, kids should get paid then. Yeah. Do you go to all the games and stuff? Oh, yeah. So I see the kids more even, than the play. Even travel and stuff? Yeah. So I'm basically, I'm with them more than any other staff member because obviously I travel, recovery, regeneration, whatever that means, um, warm-ups, cool-downs, uh, obviously the training aspect, sit on the bench. I mean, basically I'd, I'm a nutritionist on the road, like all that stuff, like setting up meals. So uh, the applied sports science, all that stuff. So, yeah, that's that part's cool because you always want to feel like you're a part of something. You know, and the more value you can bring to that situation, the more you're like, okay, I'm really helping the cause. And you're just helping with any and everything too, right? Oh, facts. Like, yeah. shit, I'm, I'm throwing on luggage on the bus. Taking yeah, luggage. somebody needs a Gatorade and you run to the store and you get some or oh, whatever the hell the case is. Yeah. 100%, man. I'm like, you're basically a utility man on the road, which yeah. is fucking awesome. I love that because I'm helping people. Like, that's what we're all in this for. At least I hope. Like, we're here to help people. I don't care if I got to clip a fucking toenail or, you know, like, or <laughs> bench press, you know, like, Anything that I could do to help. Oh, this shit was crazy. Buzzer beater. Mm, Boom. Damn. This is where I almost slip and ate shit. I was going to say, that's you in the, all, in the uh, in whole, that burgundy the, joint? Yeah. Now, my suit cardinal. game's really strong. Skirt. Man, <laughs> see that athleticism, though? It didn't fall. Didn't fall. But I almost ate shit. You can see my pinhead right there. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that, that was crazy. Damn, good coaching, man. 
good good strength coach in there. That's, that's athleticism. Pure, that's pure tricep strength on that uh, three pointer from mid court. Oh, that's exactly what that oh, was. Oh, yeah. there that was, you are. That was that three sets of twenty. Yeah, you can see my mm-hmm. bald head right now, it, yeah. leaving the ref, and then scoop. <laughs> <laughs> that was a close call. That was it. That was, oh, hey, <laughs> there it is. Dang, that's an athlete right there, boy. <laughs> and that's why you needed surgery. Mm. You just pop. <laughs> Man, no, luckily that wasn't, oh my God, if that was the case, that would have been really ugly. I've seen that happen before. Actually, it's been like national television where coaches are like blowing out their Achilles on the sideline. I'm like, oh man, it happened to a head coach at Georgia State when he was mm. there. Um, but <laughs> fun times though. Man. Do you have like any type of athletes that you really, really enjoy working with? Like sometimes when when someone wants to work with me and they're like really strong Mm -hmm. uh they're not receptive to any type of change right i mean right do you like what's your favorite and least favorite type of athlete to work with okay so great example here there's two swimmers i was talking about one is the attention span of like a fly right like just all over the place that's my favorite because it really takes coaching to get them because they have all the energy they might have all the attributes to make them really good but they don't have the steering wheel to keep them on the road and that's where i'm like okay this is coaching right now i can i'm steering talent like i'm helping them drive that the one the other it's more like everything's okay like hey uh, what do you want to do today okay no 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 that's not a response like <laughs> how do you feel today oh okay like did that hurt okay it's like what the f- no no i need some i need some feedback like let me know what's going on um but that type of athlete will fucking do anything so that, that's kind of cool too. Yeah. But I like I like it's too it's more dynamic when I can steer that 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 almost that craziness. But yeah. you have more work to do. Yeah. yeah. But basically, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially. Okay. <laughs> Great question. Yeah. Got anything else over there, Andrew? No, that's everything. I mean, well, I guess if if we were to pay you know student athletes like, Ooh, shit. yeah, I mean, because yeah. it, it is tough, right? But like, would there be like a pay scale or is it just if you're on the team then you're gonna make x amount like i think this i think it's revenue sports are the only ones that get paid because i'm sorry if you're not bringing in revenue why would you get paid like if you're the fencing team why would you get paid Mm -hmm. like it's if it's football and basketball that's help supporting you like why why the hell would you benefit from it um so but when you see images and details and all that i think when the kid leaves whatever's made from that he gets a percentage, you know? Um, but as far as like, I think there should be a standardized pay, no matter who you are. Like is, if you're a scholarship athlete, this is what you get paid um, from basketball and football. But if all of a sudden you, you know, that number five jersey is selling X amount, you know, when you leave, or your image is shown on commercials and Pac-12 network and all that stuff, I think you, you get slid something when you leave. And that's your, that's your way into professionalism. Right. But that's where I think that's a healthy balance. But once again, like there's probably way better means and methods. I'm just the meathead in the closet, yeah. not the logistics guy. But um, I think that's a fair way. But if someone, I guarantee someone has a better strategy than I do. Yeah. yeah. But at least it's kind of sparked the conversation, right? For sure. For yeah. sure. And then when that happens, it's going to get really interesting. Yeah, man. Yes. Holy shit. Uh, who's the biggest mutant you ever worked with? Who? I had this guy. Uh, his name is Reed Travis. Dude is a, he was, he, he transferred to Kentucky last year. Um, he was, he's six, eight, um, two fifty six lean as shit, like super lean, unbelievably contractile, right? Not elastic, but contractile, right? Made to lift weights. And when I first met him, I mean, I looked at him and immediately I was like, Oh my God, finally, I'm gonna have some validation. I'm just going to have this guy do like three sets of 20 on curls. And immediately I'm going to look like the best strength coach in the world. And then I realized Jesus. that's him. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a specimen. Great. Uh, he's an unbelievable, like neck up too. He's, he's really, he, he's, he's, he's really special. Wow. Um, but when I watched him move, I immediately told him like, yeah, bro, like you're not going to pick up a weight for a while. And he looked at me with the biggest smile. And I was like, what the fuck? I didn't expect that. I figured you just want to get awesome. And he's like, nah, man, everybody wants to make me strong because I can get strong. I'm already strong. I want to be a better basketball. I was like, oh, shit, man, dope. So like, we developed this immediate attraction. Like, We had a, a great relationship from day one. Um, but he's a freak. Um, now, I will say this. The biggest like performance freak I got is this uh, is one of my swimmers. Now, ask Ram, because I asked him last night, the strength coach for the Sacramento Kings. They, do, they have the same force plate technology we have. Counter movement jump. I was like, what's your average on the NBA roster, right? 
is at 18.1, which that doesn't sound high, but that's hands on hips. You're not approaching, you know, it's just a true counter movement jump. Like it's not using the arms. It's not using all this momentum to help you gain like 41 inches, like on a swipe, but it's a true measure of straight power. And he's like, yeah, 18. And I'm like, okay. Um, so my gold medal athlete just did an 18.1 and she's a chick. <laughs> right. And I was like, he's like, what the, f no. And I was like, yeah. Like that, that to me is probably the most raw power I've ever seen in a human that I've been associated with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she's freaky. I always love hearing about the mutants because there's just like these outliers, right? You know, these people that you train, you work with and they gain some weight on their, you know, bench and squat and deadlift and stuff. And like, that's really cool, but it's always interesting. There's just these people that they uh, touch a weight and they gain 30 pounds right. and just shit just goes bonkers for them and it, it's uh it's just it's just rare right you know right. i and i i wish we knew more about some of that stuff like i wish we knew more about uh what went into uh you know some of these kind of mutants that walk around and people that have won gold medals people that uh have uh won mr olympia competitions and various things like that because even <clears throat> even with performance enhancing drugs uh it's just so rare. Like there's like, I don't even know what the number would be, but it's so rare to be like a Jay Cutler or a Phil right. Heath or, or, um, you know, and, and even just to be like one of, one of these, uh, to be like a LeBron James, like what the hell, like I, I it's genetics, obviously, right. uh, coming into play environment and, you know, there's their mindset and a lot of things coming all together. Um, or like Shaq, Right. You know, like, right. what, like where, what the fuck planet is Shaq from? <laughs> well, it's so funny you bring up PEDs because people automatically associate, like, especially when you think of, like, IFBB pro bodybuilders, and you're like, bro, like, Jersey Shore douchebag is taking the same shit. <laughs> like, come on, like, like there's a genetic component he to this. He has 100 pounds less. <laughs> right, exactly. And you're like, come on, man, like, don't, 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 don't throw the PED thing on them. Like, that's bullshit. Like, at the end of the day, it's still a lot of talent, a lot of genetics, and a shitload of fucking hard work to get to that. So that's one thing you see, especially in my field. It's like, oh, like, oh, he ran fast because he took some shit. It's like, dude, okay. Oh, okay. Like, you still got to earn that shit. Like, and, so, are, and a lot of it's gifted, too. Who are some of your favorite, uh, like, mentors, uh, What you know, in, in the strength and conditioning world, like, strength coaches like who do you follow are there some certain books that you've read that you really liked and, and things like that yeah i mean my mentor i mean jonas serration i mean just fucking amazing human being um he's by far who i lean on the most um he's the only reason why i'm somewhat relevant in this field because he gave me my shot right he gave me the opportunity to to work for free for him <laughs> and be able to foster some of his knowledge and he's been able to direct me from there but people that i really like look up to and respect and able to talk to a lot um, Jordan Shallow, big friend of mine recently, uh, the muscle doc, um, God, so smart. He's, uh, in the area, isn't he? Yeah. So he, he's actually like a nomad. Like he travels all over the place. I think we've communicated with him a little bit before we were working on getting him here. He's, he's quite intellectual. <laughs> like it's, it's when you see that type of intelligence and brawn together, you're just like, whoa, shit. Like, Jordan man. Shallow, right? Jordan Shallow. Yeah. yeah. Um, and him and Ben Pakulski do a lot of work together. They oh, do like right, a lot of these right. tours. Um, I was on Ben's podcast. Like, he's brilliant too. Good God. He's on a different level. Um, but like as far as like mentors, you know, people that are, they're not really mentors, but I, but I, I just, from afar, I just admire like Buddy Morris. Like, I, I mean, gosh, like I've never even talked to the guy, but I mean, I watch old YouTube videos he, of him uh, at coach, Pittsburgh. He was Coach X, right? For a yeah, while. yeah, on, yeah. Uh, Elite. On Elite. Yeah. 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 I used to read all those forms and I was like, oh man, like I just, I just, man, he's, I, 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 he's someone I really that stuff really was fun back in the day the elite FTS uh, yeah. forums and it, stuff like that it was literally the site I went to every day so I'm at Campbell University in Bowie's Creek North Carolina and I was seriously like that was my major source of information was I just go to elite and what's new on elite today and I would follow all the athletes logs and what do they do for training today and that's what I'm going to do and I went to a seminar 15 years ago that had uh, in Las Vegas, just kind of on a whim. I heard like last second that Louis Simmons was going to be at the seminar. This was before I ever met Louis or before I ever trained at Westside. It might even been more like 20 years ago. But uh, I heard last second. I told my wife about it, and then she got me tickets like as a surprise gift. And uh, I went to it, and I met um, I met James Smith was there. Coach House was there. Jesus. Mark Uyama was there Jesus. and it was like three or four other like, you know, stud, uh, head, head con strength and conditioning coaches like 
in the NFL or in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And they, and they weren't like, no one was really anywhere at the time. Right. Like Coach House was like already with Arizona State and Mark was already making some of his mark. But for the most, most part, a lot of other people really weren't. Got them in their infancy, man. Yeah, uh, weren't anywhere. And we always talk about that. And we're like, it was at like the Bellagio and Coach House is like, <laughs> He goes, yeah, it was at the Bellagio, but we were in like some garage or something. He's like, I don't even know if anybody knew that seminar was going on. I was like, yeah, I, I know. It was crazy, but. Well, I remember Elite, really they, cool. they gave me this really cool opportunity. So um, I, I want to make sure I got this right. Matt Rhodes, Vincent DiZenzo, and yeah, Jim Winley. The yep. uh, they held this um, like learn to train seminar or whatever it was up in Pittsburgh. Mm. And they did it. One guy like. Uh, uh, couldn't make it, but he already paid for it. He's like, just use it as a scholarship for somebody. And so I think it was Vincent who had this essay contest. And I was like, the like, I think I came in like third or fourth, <laughs> but it was basically like, why do you deserve to be here? Right. And mm -hmm. at that time I was like basically homeless. I was like, I'm fucking like, I'm living in my office trying to figure shit out all the way in North Carolina. This shit's in Pittsburgh. He sends me an email on Thursday night or no. Yeah. I was on a Thursday night saying, Hey, it's yours. If you want it. And I was like, shit, I'll be there. So I got my little sorority chick. Fucking Volkswagen Jetta, <laughs> just <laughs> jetted all the way up to Pittsburgh overnight. Well, I stayed with someone in DC and then finished the trip. Um, and then that that was like, I mean, like you don't hear that shit no more with with my world. It's like people just want shit. And but it's like, for instance, you, your wife was so awesome just to get you tickets just to be in that moment. Yeah. And for me, I was like, holy shit, I get to be in this moment. And I'm sitting there like freezing my ass off because I'm like basically like waiting two hours in the car before the shit happens. Now my wife has done a couple like, th there's been these weird, like these things that you would think would be small mm -hmm. that have like forever changed like my life and her and I's life together. It's amazing. It, like it's really almost eerie. Like uh, for example, she was working for a fitness magazine. It was a trade magazine. Mm -hmm. And um, I was a huge fan of Elite. And I think I was already, maybe I was already writing on there. I don't know if you know, but I was writing on the yeah, name Jackass. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> That's kind of this, how this whole fucking pile of shit started. Um, and uh, I can't remember if I was already writing for them or, or what the case was, but I, I loved the site. I was a huge Dave Tate fan. And, um, you know, I, I connected her with Dave Tate because I was like, oh, it'd be cool. She works for this fitness magazine. Uh, maybe she can get out the word, you know, that he's got these books and has the site mm -hmm. and so on. And so, yeah, they communicated on that. And she, you know, um, gave him like a free ad in, in the magazine or whatever. And he was like, oh, well, if your husband's a fan, let me send you some tapes. Stop. I watch those fucking tapes every day that's sick every day I, i'd and i'd rewind them and i keep watching them and it's like you can't hear anything they're right. shot from the other side of the room <laughs> it's like louis simmons spitting all this weird knowledge uh -huh. and um she would come home from like work and she'd be like would you just give it a rest she's like our vcr is gonna like break <laughs> right, you know right. like she's like do i have to listen to this every day all day i'm like yeah i'm trying to learn i want to know more about all this stuff right. you know that's sick man. yeah that was the See, i love stories like that because <laughs> they're just so far and few between now in the age of information yeah. right, and how readily available it is. And it turns into, well, people think it's easy. So they just, and this is shit. Like there's need to be, there needs to be some type of etiquette about talking to people now because they just assume that it's like, okay, I'm just going to ask you shit and not give anything in return. And it's like, no, fuck that. Like, come on. Like this has got to be a two way street rather. I don't care if you fucking buy me a coffee. Like, I, I, like let's at least talk about this. Yeah. But now because everything's so readily available, they assume humans are just so readily available as well. And it's like the more content you produce, the more shit that comes like, oh, here's this five paragraph DM. Can you answer all these questions for me? Like, fuck no. <laughs> like, dude, like I appreciate, you know, the message, but who can who can reach out to all of that? And but with those type of stories, they just don't exist anymore. It's so dope. We had somebody on the podcast recently who was talking about how he doesn't understand how people don't, you know, attend to all their DM messages. And so I after the podcast, I didn't want to, you know, scorn him on the show here, but after the podcast, I showed him mine. I'm like, this I'm is like, why. dude, look. You're right. And I said, look what happens when I do answer somebody. And then it just goes again. Yeah. And again. they ask a lot more, which I, I don't mind. You know, I, I, I do try to get to people here and there and I encourage people to ask questions, but man, you just, it's not possible to get to all of them. I mean, I only have like X amount. You have unbelievable <laughs> amounts. So I can only imagine like triple f shit more than that, yeah. what that would look like. Yeah. But and, and to me, I just go back to, well, this is why I'm putting out content. 
So it's rather, it's coming at some point to answer your question. So oh, just sometimes wait it's on it. super lazy. Hey, right. you have any videos on the bench? It's like, it's like <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> and it's like, we just had someone here too, like at that bench 715 pounds. Sorry if that video wasn't enough. Right, for you, exactly, but... <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it's, there's a, there's a point where people need to monetize, you know, and yeah. that's where it's, I think that's where the crossroads I'm at right now. Cause you know, college is whatever, like college is amazing. It's a nice little safety blanket. Like I don't have to go get clients. Clients right. are already provided for me. Uh, but that, I think that's like my next step is like, okay, how am I going to be able to make a living off of this? Um, uh, but it'll be interesting. We'll see. Um, what are some other things that you had to do? Uh, cause like, I, I do think these stories are important. You mentioned that story, you know, traveling to that seminar, yeah. kind of mentioned being like homeless, like living out of your car type of deal. Like what other uh, shit sandwiches did you have to eat? Man. Okay. There's, there's some pretty good ones. Um, what, what? cause being a strength coach is hard. And then once you are a strength coach, it's not like. Um, it's not like you're rolling in dough either. Like it's a it's a right. tough job. There's a lot of hours associated with it. It's hard. Well, so here here was my situation at the time. So I get my I'm getting my master's at Campbell University, which no one's ever fucking heard of. They're the Fighting Camels. It's like sweet mascot, right? Orange Camel in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. Anyways, <laughs> so I'm getting my master's there. I just so happened to luckily land a GA there at the last second. Like it was literally last second. I had six teams there, right, including football. Then I would drive, and I lived in Raleigh temporarily. And then me and my girl Brooks, and then I was that that was the homeless part. <laughs> so then I would drive all the way from Bowie's Creek, North Carolina, to Chapel Hill, which is an hour and a half, and I would do that back and forth mm. daily, and then go to night school. So I had six teams at Campbell. I would go up to Carolina to do as much as I can with men's basketball. Then I come down from seven to nine or seven to ten doing night school. I did that shit for two years, and I was like. <laughs> When you're in the moment, you don't know it. When you're in the moment, you're like, this is just what I got to do. And that's one thing that I'm just, so many people won't eat that shit sandwich because they just, like, no, that's what you have to do. I'm not saying you have to, like, you know, fucking be homeless or anything, but, like, you have to just engulf yourself in a situation. It is what it is like, until you get to where you want to get to. But a lot of people just, like, they fold so quick. And that's great for people like me. Should I get job security, <laughs> you know? But that was the biggest one for me. It was, like, fuck, how am I going to do this for two years? And then... You know, I was at the OTC getting paid. I think it was like that time it was like fucking maybe it was below minimum wage because they gave me a dorm, mm -hmm. right? And this is like minimum wage, like back when minimum wage was like six bucks. You know what I mean, like that was a long time ago. And then I was the director at Santa Clara. Now this is like my oh yeah, baby, I made it, right? Santa Clara, low major. I didn't know I was the director until I got there. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just a men's and women's basketball job. I'm like yeah, fuck yeah, basketball mm -hmm. division one. Here we go. And I get there and I'm like yeah, whose office is that? And they're like oh that's your office. And I was like. Oh, cool. So, like, well, where's the boss's office? And they're like, No, no, no. You're the, you're the boss. Like, you're the, you run this weight room. I'm like, oh shit, I'm getting mail at my work saying, Oh, you've a, you've a, what's it called? Uh, you've a qualified for low income this and low income that. And I'm sitting there like, Holy shit! So I'm like 24 years old, living out in California. I'm from the fucking mountains of Virginia, like hillbilly shit. Don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Um, and then, it's really bad in Virginia. I've been there, bro. Like, man, you go to like <laughs> no, the coal mining like, aspect. I'm not even terrible, trying to like bro. kid and be insulting to you. I, no, I it's no, just nuts, me. man. It's, so I'm like right where all the states meet. It's fucking crazy, bro. It's, uh, so like I'm an hour <laughs> crazy and a half train. from West Virginia, then I'm 30 minutes from North Carolina, and then like another hour and a half. Kentucky's to Tennessee. got nothing on that and area. Well, that's where I went to school. It was in Kentucky. That's where <laughs> that shit was. It was You've like been hanging out in all the good bro, spots. I've been in the hollers and I've been in meth central like wow. for most of my life. But, <laughs> um, but coming from that scenario and then going to California, it was like, what the fuck? Like, this is just a wild, you know? <laughs> but there's a lot of people that had it way worse than me. Like, I got fast tracked in this shit. I came into the strength game when it was like the bubble bursted, like literally at the moment it yeah. blew up. Mm. And so that's why I got so lucky. Holy shit. If I even came in a year later, I probably wouldn't have had the opportunities. Now, my, the only, shit, I got a director's job at the age of 24 off the ignorance of a sport coach. Like, if anybody looked at my qualifications, they'd be like, this guy's never actually got paid to be a strength coach. We're going to make him the director. And I'm sitting there like, thanks, guys. But I had that little North Carolina logo right there in the mm -hmm. Olympic Training Center flag. And I was like, oh, this guy must be legit. <laughs> you didn't really look close enough. Okay, got it. So that's like my first paying job. And I didn't know what, the, I was all the way away from the country, from home. I didn't have anybody out here. Like, it was, it was wild, man, wild times. But and once again, there's a lot more people that's had it worse and is going through it currently. Yeah, you just got to go for it, though. Dude, my fucking intern, he's amazing, by the way. His name's Kohei. He's from Japan. Language barrier, automatically fucked, right? But he's 
interning for free in Palo Alto. You know how expensive that shit is? <laughs> like, holy hell. And I'm doing everything I can to get this kid a job. And he's got to get a job by the next two months with a professional or higher education or else he's going to get deported. So, like, Gosh. I have this mission. So, uh, hashtag Kohei coach job. Uh, <laughs> but I'm trying to get this kid a job ASAP, man. <laughs> That's right. real problems, though. That's real problems. Yeah, I didn't know. That's I, brutal. Yeah, I had problems, but I didn't have real problems. All right, guys, that's it. Strength is never a weakness. Catch you guys later.